All right, it's uh, January 14th, it is 6.34, and I will call this meeting to order. This is a public meeting of the Joint School Board, excuse me, this is a joint public meeting of the School Board of West Bend, Joint School District Number 1. More than 24 hours prior to the meeting, notice of time, place, date, and subject matter of this meeting was posted in each school building, the entrance doors at the Education Service Center, and at the West Bend Community Memorial Library. A copy was also sent to the Daily News, WBKB, Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, and other media sources who have requested notice of our meetings. Deb, can you confirm this meeting was properly posted? Yes, it was. Please stand for the pledge. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Welcome back from our our holiday break. We've got a recognized form of the board here tonight. Before we get started, I think a lot of the, the board and the community knows we lost a family member of the district for, uh, last week, and uh, Andy Pinton's passed away unexpectedly last week. She was spent 25 years as a, uh, a staff member of our district over at Badger. Her husband is a retired English, or excuse me, retired German teacher in our district, and uh, heavily involved family. So I'll just ask that you keep uh, the Pinton's family and friends and loved ones in your thoughts and prayers. I will take a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Any questions on the agenda? All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. We have a full agenda tonight, but we'll start with our student reports. Uh, good evening, board. A little in East Athletics, East Girls Gymnastics will be competing at the Arrowhead Invitational on Thursday evening. The East Boys basketball team dropped to third place in conference after a hard-fought battle against top-ranked Nicolet last week. The boys are hoping to get back on the winning track on Friday night against the Cedarburg Bulldogs. East Sun Wrestling finished first place at the David Cohen Classic held at North Fond du Lac High School last weekend. The boys are back in action on Thursday at Slinger High School for a North Shore Western Division title that's on the line. East Girls Basketball will be facing off in an out-of-conference matchup against our rivals to the north, the Kowaskam Indians, on Thursday evening. Uh, this is coming after a decisive victory over Nicolay last week. In uh, co-ops between West and East, uh, the girls' hockey team is going to be playing in Fond du Lac on Saturday. The boys' swim meet will be held at Nicolay at 6 o'clock on Friday. And the boys' hockey game will be in Oshkosh North on Saturday as well. I'll pass it over to my West Kafka. <laughs> Thank you. Um, lots going on for West Athletics, too. We're kind of in the full swing of our winter sports. So the boys have a basketball game Tuesday at South Milwaukee and at Grafton on Friday, both at 7.15. Girls basketball has a game on Friday versus Grafton at 5.45. Gymnastics has a meet on Thursday versus Nicolay at 6.30 and will comp be competing at an Invitational at Arrowhead on Saturday. Boys Bowling had a meet this evening at 4 and so did Girls Bowling. Uh, boys were in Cedarburg and Girls were in Port Washington. Boys Wrestling did a great job with the Norse Heat invite into Forest this past weekend with three wrestlers taking first place and one taking second and many other placers. And they'll be wrestling Whitefish Bay for parent and senior night on Thursday at 7 o'clock. The dance team competed at the Kakana Dance Classic this past Saturday, taking fourth in kick, third in jazz, and second in palm. And they have a competition showcase in the South Gym Saturday at 6 p.m. There's also some other exciting um, extracurriculars and events going on at the high school. On the 25th, there's going to be a pep assembly to kick off second semester with a staff versus student basketball game. That should be very interesting. And the Classical Chamber Concert hosted at the West Bend High School Art Center will be on January 27th. Also, the Science Olympiads had their first invitational competition um, two weekends ago, and they did fantastic with a fifth place medal in Disease Detectives, fourth place medal in Code Busters, Circuit Lab, and Anatomy and Physiology, and the third place medal in Geocaching. So lots of exciting things going on at the high school, and thanks again for having us. Awesome. Thank you very much. Good update. We come to the public participation portion of our agenda. Board Policy 187 prescribes the nature and procedures of this segment. I summarize the policy at this time, but copies of the policy are available in the back of the room, and I urge you to familiarize yourself with the policy in its entirety. Residents of the district, parents of children in district schools, and employees of the district may participate. 
Participants desiring to address the board should obtain and complete a participant comment card and turn it over to me here at the desk prior to the meeting. Yeah, scroll down here. Each participant will be called to the podium and given three minutes to speak. The participant must state his or her name, address, and relation to the district. This information will appear in the minutes of the meeting. The board will not engage in debate concerning the remarks or take immediate action. The board may refer the matter to the superintendent, a committee, or take the remarks into consideration in the future. Board Policy 872 provides a formal process for citizen complaints, and Board Policy 520 provides a formal process for employee complaints. The board recommends use of these procedures as they guarantee a fair and timely response. I've received 12 comment cards. If each individual speaks for three minutes, that would put us over the 30 minutes that um, our policy allows for this portion of the of the meeting, but with a simple majority vote, we can extend that time period. So I will move to allow for additional time for tonight's public participation segment. Second. Any questions on that? Comments? All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Motion carries. I've put these kind of in order and in, of topic here. So not necessarily in order that you gave them to me, but they're in order of topic. So we'll start with uh, quite a few cards in relation to pathways, and I am not the best at names, so I apologize if I mispronounce your name, but we'll start with Diana Swillinger. And then Connor Markun will be up next. Good evening, Diana Swillinger, 614 Jefferson Street, a parent of four children in the district and a Pathways Governance Council member. I have a small amount of time to say a lot, so I'm not going to mince words. I will read right from my statement and speak as fast as I can. Um, and please know I say all of this with the utmost respect for all of you, and I appreciate the service that you give to the community. I intended to, today to share an opinion about the future pathways. I will, but I want to address a, a concern quickly first. Late Friday afternoon, the district presented the school board with a report of pathways created by a loan critic from Black and Associates. The Governance Council was told when the evaluation happened that it was to inform pathways accountability plan. We were not told it would be shared outside of that purpose. The evaluation period was in the 2017 and 2018 school year, yet the results were not shared with pathways staff or Governance Council in any written form ever. We were introduced to the document only when it was shared with you just one business day before the superintendent, who, to the best of my knowledge, um, has not completed his own thorough observation or evaluation of pathways, is likely to recommend the discontinuation of the contract. In the kindest terms, um, some could call this move strategic and clever, but when we consider the impact it will have on the educational, vocational, and um, developmental journeys of the children, our children, real students here in the district, this move could be seen as manipulative, perhaps self-serving, at best, this is not something I would use as an example to share with my own children to demonstrate good business, good politics, or goodwill. And I find the lack of disclosure with the Passway staff and Governance Council and last minute exposure to the board disappointing and discouraging. Um, now to my original comments. Pathways has produced a plethora of positive results. You've heard in testimony in December, I'm imagining you're going to hear more tonight. This, to discontinue this partnership with Passways would be to displace dozens of students from the rigorous and unique education they credit for their success, and I believe it would be a mistake, a mistake um, based on an incompatible and formulaic report card that is skewed on many levels, as has been previously addressed. I'm a fiscally responsible person. I've seen the budget of pathways, and in the grand scheme of the district spending, I believe it's a drop in the bucket. To eliminate the partnership based on money would be a disproportionate reaction to the value it provides to the many students who attend there and who will attend in the future. As the world starts to embrace the reality that students in neat rows of desks with one-size-fits-all education <coughs> underserves our children and their futures, Pathways is leading the way. This school started with an innovative and courageous dream. Please tell me you are not ready to quit that dream because we feel like we are just getting started. Please tell me you won't quit because we hit a couple of obstacles. What? Uh, what will we tell? Yes, what will we tell the kids if the contract to the only school that has awakened their desire to learn isn't renewed? Sorry kids, we hit a couple obstacles, a little bit on the budget, and the state report card doesn't accurately display the amazing things happening here and in your life, so we quit. For much of Pathos' existence, the district administration has taken little interest, and now the interest seems to be only in the <coughs> obstacles, while paying little attention to the success and not embracing incredible character development and educational journey of the students, which if you spend a little time there, you will see it is real and it's obvious. 
These are things that don't fit into the standardized reports and spreadsheets. If the contract isn't renewed, it will be viewed by many as misplaced priorities, a lack of vision, and disinterest in the needs of the students, possibly a knee-jerk reaction to a struggling budget. If the contract is renewed, it will be viewed by many as an investment in the future of an amazing and creative population of students, the ingenuity of education, rigor of studies, and an evolving path of education. Thank you. Thank you very much. As we go through more uh, people speaking to the board tonight, please just be courteous. Of, if you hear something already said, maybe you know keep things uh, you know moving along. So uh, Connor is up next, and then we'll go to Austin Dooler. Good evening. My name is Connor Marcon. Uh, my address is three six one five Beaver Bend Road. I'm an eighth grade student at Pathfinders Charter School. I'm 13 and a half years old. An Eagle Scout with over 400 hours of community service member of the WSMA Middle Level Honors Choir in 2018, a 4.0 honor roll student and a budding pianist, musical composer, and video editor. I did edit the video you watched in Pathways at your meeting last month. I share some of my background with you, not to celebrate myself and my achievements, but to clarify the image you may have of the students at Pathways based upon a recent DPI report card rating of meets few expectations. I am not a student who meets few expectations and I exceed them. In fact, I, and many of my classmates at Pathways, exceed expectations not only in the academic arena, but in other areas that are relevant to life and contributing to our community. Did you know five of our high school students trained and helped earn our Heart Safe School accreditation through the Project Adam and Children's Hospital? One of our current senior male students interns with the West Bend Fire Department, and one of our high school female students was part of the Honors Orchestra for the WSMA. We have a ninth grader who competes in diving and helps his family run the towed bike race here in West Bend. And two of our eighth grade students completed the entire math curriculum before Christmas and are already learning the ninth grade algebra. We have a lot of skilled and enthusiastic students who are learning in their classroom that life is more about living and giving your joy than getting a high score on an AC or forward test. Pathways encourages us to pursue our passions and work independently to achieve project goals. But it also teaches us skill sets that we can and do use in business settings through in internships, jobs, and volunteer opportunities throughout Washington County. Skills like cooperation and communication, leadership, organization, planning, and budget, ma budget management, self-discipline, and motivation. When considering the fate of Pathways, please look deeper than a statistically irrelevant rating of meets few expectations, and consider instead the long-term beneficial ramifications of having a school that is based more on the exploration of self the discovery and application of talents, and the grooming of business-savvy and community-centered leaders. This is what Pathways does for me and for many of my classmates. It gives us real-life skills, teaches us how to apply them for the benefit of our employers, society, and families, and helps us understand that when we embrace our highest and best selves, we empower others to do the same. And that is how we engender personal responsibility and create overall positive change. Thank you so much for your time and consideration. Thank you very much. Austin, and then we'll go to Jenny Dooler. Uh, hello. Uh, I, my name is Austin Thomas Duller, uh, N111 W15655 uh, Vanacore, Germantown. I am a previous uh, Pathways graduate of 2017 to 2018. Uh, Pathways has really been life changing. Um, in more ways than I can really count, ranging from the students to the teachers, it has changed who I, I really am today. Uh, my story really begins from my, uh, my second freshman year when I started at Pathways. I had struggled in the, the standard high school setting. Uh, it, it didn't really work out for me, and uh, through counseling I had found the Pathways and within the three years that I had been there, I had completed all four of my uh, high school years and graduated on time and then have moved on to, to go into college. Uh, the, sorry, uh, the coaches are, the coaches here are some of the best people like I've ever met. They are not only teachers, but they're uh, lifelines at times. Like uh, when you start a project, uh, it's as if they toss you into the water. Like you, you swim, but if you need if you need help, they'll they'll throw you a lifeline. They won't carry you or hold your hand through it. They'll they'll uh, well sorry. They uh, they they help you through it in the the best way they can um, through 
questions, different ideas, and different perspectives and solutions. They critique your work and give you the ability to shape it into a masterpiece. Uh, they've helped me through high school and helped me grow into the person I am today to be successful in high school then, in college, and studies in my life beyond. Thank you. Thank you, Austin. Jenny. And then we'll go to Chelsea Adelman Del Davis. <coughs> North 111, West 15655, Vienna Court, Germantown. I am um, Austin's parent. He graduated this past June from Pathos. Um, I just wanted to say a few things about being a parent and what it means to have a child that attended Pathways. Um, being a parent is a tough job, but it only gets more difficult when your children are struggling and you don't know how else to help them. My son Austin was that child. He's intelligent, hardworking, and kind. However, he had struggled in the traditional school setting. I'd always been in close contact with his former teachers, and we had gotten to a point where we didn't know what else we could do to help him, and it didn't matter how much we communicated, we were just kind of hitting that wall. Um, by the end of freshman year, it was pretty apparent that he had basically given up. He was unmotivated, every day was a struggle, he pretty much failed every class that he had taken his freshman year. In speaking to the guidance counselor, we learned through, about Pathways and attended their informational meeting. Um, their alternative type setting and electronic project-based learning was very interesting and yet a foreign concept to us. Um, that was really the first time, though, that I had seen any excitement out of Austin regarding school. Um, he was so incredibly successful as a pathway student, not only because of how the program is set up, but because of how the coaches there are. Um, they take students in and they embrace each child's future goals and dreams, and then they take, um, they help them create a path to get to that goal. Um, they are such a positive guiding influence to these students by instilling life skills, goal setting, project conception, time management, and creative thinking. These team projects, as well as individual projects, are almost all conceptualized based off of what the students are hoping to pursue in the future. Um, Austin flourished at Pathways. He became his own person, positive, outgoing, hardworking, and successful. All of the things that we knew that he was capable of. Even moving out of the Westland School District to Germantown, Austin insisted on completing his time at Pathways, so I transported him every day from Germantown to the high school for two years, um, and it was worth every single minute. Um, so then in this past spring, he met with the scholarship committee for the Pathways um, School and was awarded a scholarship to college. He's now halfway through his freshman year of college, and I see him utilizing all the skills that he learned through Pathways. And he speaks very, very highly about that school and how much he misses it and how influential it was to him. I really think that it would be a terrible decision for the school district to give up on this program. There are really some, um, there really should be more information given out about it and really pursued. I feel that there are a great deal of students that would really benefit from that program and parents that want the best education possible for their students. Catherine's is definitely the best thing that's ever come along for us. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Chelsea Epps. And then we'll go to Amy Pedrowski. Good evening. My name is Chelsea Doman Davis. I live at North 174 West 20332 Creekside Drive in Jackson. Last month, I came and spoke to you as a parent of four children in the district and shared my very personal reasons for needing the Charter at Pathways to be renewed. Tonight, I have again skipped my own PTO meeting to address you but as a concerned citizen and outside of the emotion of how my family would be adversely affected by the dissolution of Catholic's Charter School. I have several points I hope the board will consider in this matter. Firstly, the Charter School provides options, which is a choice we value in Wisconsin. Other school districts in the area have launched or are launching similar efforts, such as the River Edge Outdoor Learning School in neighboring northern Ozaki. By removing options here, you are encouraging families to go elsewhere. The revenue limit here has been negatively impacted in the past due to students attending other districts. At Pathways, the students have to engage in the learning process. They drive it. My eighth grader recently protested when his father to think creatively about a problem at home because he gets too much practice. He said at my school, it's all about working creatively. The student-led learning and innovation should be spreading <coughs> to other classrooms, not fighting to stay alive. As you know, the vision of the West Bend School District is to prepare all students for college readiness and career success. Pathways supports this vision more fully than the other options in the upper grades. Secondly, charter schools are a really great thing. Stanford University recently conducted a survey of charter schools in 41 urban areas around the nation. 
their findings show that the typical charter school student accumulated 40 days of additional learning in math and 28 days of reading. This is above their peers in traditional classrooms. Over the four-year study, positive results increased. The school has not been given enough of a chance. It opened for grades 7 through 10 in 2013 and it added a class per year until the start of the 2015 school year. In other words, it is only in its fourth school year serving 7th through 12th grade. By dissolving this school while it's gaining momentum, you're cutting off the experiment much too soon. Additionally, why hasn't the school district advertised pathways more? At this point, there shouldn't be any parent who doesn't know about the school, and yet I've repeatedly explained the vision of pathways to parents I meet at the library and the baseball diamond and museums and school drop-off and other community events. Every time I talk about the career readiness, the community involvement, and the project-based approach, everyone is interested in this affordable alternative to the traditional classroom. I question what the issue really is here. It can't be a money issue because the equalized assessed value of the district has increased four years in a row. The tax rates for education have decreased. The S&P rating for the district is a double A, which is commendable. Last year's budget promised no reduction in programming and courses, so what has changed? As Superintendent Kirkyard explained in a November meeting, the district has the lowest debt ratio when compared to the surrounding areas. So if money is not the problem, and you want families to have choices within the district, it seems renewing the charter is an obvious choice. Thank you. Thank you. Amy, and then Anne-Marie Lancer. My name is Amy Hodorowski, 2476 East Sauk Road, Grafton. I have three children in the school district, two at Pathways. About five years ago, I was invited by Ted Maisky to be part of a roundtable discussion, which included incoming Governor Tony Evers, other local business leaders, and West Bend School District officials. The focus of this meeting was the future of the West Bend schools, with the idea that this district could lead the way for the future for change in the state. The discussion revolved around career readiness, career-focused educational pathways, and most importantly, integration of the schools with the community and its businesses and industry. I left the meeting beyond excited and proud to be a part of the district. Later that year, Pathways became a reality. My middle son, Joe, entered seventh grade at Pathways, and the project-based learning worked. His engagement with school and learning soared. He moved on to 8th grade, and my youngest son then started 7th grade at Pathways after hearing his brother talk about his love for the school and the hands-on learning format. I was very excited for their future knowing they had this ahead of them. In my eyes, the vision of that meeting almost six years ago has become a reality. When I talk of Pathways to my colleagues and friends, they all wish their children could go there as well. They wish their district had a Pathways. They think highly of West Bend School District. Sadly, however, and Chelsea mentioned this, when I talk to other West Bend District parents, they don't understand Pathways. They don't know what it's about. I have also educated and talked to people so they know more about it. That's coming from me. Not one parent really knows or understands the vision or mission of Pathways, which led me to ask several questions. How was the success of Pathways measured? Were clear goals ever set? Was solid marketing or engagement to the West Bend School District parents really ever made? or is the success truly only being measured by their test scores? The West Bend School District created this school and like any fledgling business or idea, it needs time to grow. No business can be super successful in a handful of years. I'm asking you to give the school a fair chance. Work with pathways to establish clear goals that are not just numbers based on test scores. Support pathways. Provide resources and increase community education to bring up the enrollment. Allow time for more classes to graduate. Please give Pathways the chance to shine in our community and continue to give our students a learning opportunity that's unparalleled in our state. Thank you. Anne-Marie? <coughs> and then we'll go to Mary White. Hi, my name is Anne-Marie Lancer. I am currently a parent representative on the Governance Council of Pathways. Um, I have a son at Pathways. He's in his third year. Um, I decided that I wanted to speak today regarding the core values of our district, kind of to, to draw in what I think, um, how it is so fitting that we have Pathways. The first one is learning for all. 
Um, many parents of Pathways kids, Pathways students, and Pathways graduates have explained to us um, that many kids learn differently and do not thrive in the traditional setting. Um, Twelve families expressed their satisfaction um, in December and pride in the results achieved via Pathways and project-based learning. So that's the second core value, customer satisfaction. We're there. Um, as a district, we should take pride in the innovation displayed by professionals in our community who have devoted years and countless hours establishing this unique charter opportunity for our kids. The fourth uh, core value that we have is uh, results and data-driven. We continue to see amazing results out of our pathway students. The uh, Project Showcase nice nights are a testament to that if you've attended. There's just these kids who are bursting with excitement about what they chose for their project and they're so professional in their delivery. Um, the fifth uh, core value, commitment and engagement. I want to thank you for your continued commitment to engage with us as the Governance Council and the many families and stakeholders who are depending on a five-year renewal. The seventh core value that we hold is our people. From administrators, the board, coaches, counselors, community partners, um, community participants, partners, and our students. Um, sorry, lost my place. Um, we've gotten us to this point, and I hope that the eighth core value of responsible stewardship of our children and the coming leaders will be considered greatly. Um, and the ninth core value that we hold in the district is integrity, and I trust that we have the integrity to truly listen to our families and students who have found their needs not just met, but exceeded at Pathways Charter School. Thank you. Thank you. Mary, I actually have two cards up here for me and Mary, and I guess I don't care what comment. I, I do for some reason. I don't care what subject you talk about, but you still just get three cards, so. <laughs> and then we'll do uh, Monty. So, it's hard to follow some of those kids. They do a great job. My name is Mary Wigand. I live at 5629 Colleen Lane, West Bend. I am here, let me just start my timer, to talk about education. I'm speaking on this topic today and giving the board the benefit of the doubt that you just don't know. So I'll educate. Just as you all and the superintendent needed to be educated on um, violating my First Amendment rights when I wanted to have this flyer hung up um, for the event on evolution, racism, and shootings as they're a link. Um, I would like to educate you on the social studies curriculum at Badger Middle School. It is simply atheistic indoctrination that man evolved from a brutal ape-like animal. I have a couple of, oh, and by the way, Wednesday at the ESC from 3.30 to 4.30, um, here I'll be doing a presentation with um, the principal at Badger and some others. So what is being taught? This um, is from your website, Early Ancestors Image Sort. It says that these images show our early ancestors. And I'll we'll just show everybody, and I have copies for you guys too. Um, this one is Early Ancestors. The images above represent our cousins. So here are some more handouts. So let me just see my time here. Okay. Um, I don't have a whole lot of time to get into a lot of things, but um, these handouts, I wrote down some artistic, just these ape men, all we do is find bones of apes in the ground. We don't see the whites of their eyes. That's all art artistic interpretation. So when students see an ape man with whites of their eyes, they think, oh wow, it's half human. And then Lucy is shown walking upright here. That's a fabrication. Um, and I have a handout about the Laetoli footprints. The reason that when you um, see a Lucy creature, Australopithecine afarensis, they have human feet. It's because of the Laetoli footprints that were found in the same layer as Lucy that are actually human footprints. So are we smarter today just because we have smartphones in our pockets? No, we're not. In fact, I have a lot of books here about genetic entropy 
written by John Sanford, who is a Cornell University researcher. Um, he actually went to Madison as well. And he talks about bones of contention, another book he wrote, showing that the bones do not add up, and genetically as well. I don't have time to go into it. Also, uh, here's some books, The Puzzle of Ancient Man and The Genius of Ancient Man. But we're telling our kids in social studies that we evolved from a lower creature and we're getting smarter. It's not true. Now, Mr. Kierkegaard, you um, said that you were afraid of offending someone and that's why you know he wouldn't post this. The students in Badger are linked up to the same website that have these eight men. And Mr. Kierkegaard said, rightly so, oh, some people might be offended by this. But the students are linked up and I was trying to expose it where the students are taught that it's true. So it's a Smithsonian site. So I just want to challenge you, you guys are responsible for what you're taught. Um, there's a scientist, I have a quote, saying they, don't, they know this, that the evidence doesn't fit, but they don't want a divine foot in the door. I'm just asking the truth be taught in our classes. The standards don't even require human evolution. So, sorry, I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you. Monty, and then we'll go to Valerie. <coughs> Thank you. I'm Monty Schmidt, 707 East Kilborn Avenue, West Bend, Wisconsin, and a resident of the district. I would like to talk to you also about the uh, science and uh, social studies. Uh, Mary brought this to my attention uh, with regard to Unit 6 for the Grade 7 Social Studies, which really gets into uh, human, uh, human evolution. Um, it's in the social studies standards. Uh, in the science standards, there's actually no mention specifically of human evolution. And there's no, no mention of it in that particular standard for the social studies uh, unit either. Uh, it does mention plate tectonics, but it doesn't say anything about human evolution. So I don't know how Trent would know, prior or anyone would know for that matter, what that unit is about but it's primarily about human evolution. Science is defined uh, for purposes of public school curriculum as being based on nature and what we find in nature. That's fine, except that that is really a limited view of reality. <coughs> and the science standards do have one statement in late grade standards that um, there are other ways of knowing. They don't go into what other, other ways of knowing there might be. I'm not quite sure what that standard is supposed to lead to. But certainly, limiting our view to nature only is, is really a, a misuse of science. We find that there is plenty of evidence out there for, I'm gonna say there's evidence for evolution if you wanna interpret it that way. There's evolution, or there's evidence that would dictate against um, the theories that are proposed for that. But to, uh, quite often, the evidence is selected or ignored. Actually, what we have taking place is discrimination against religion uh, in the public school curriculum, when science is based only on what's implied to be factual information about evolution. As board members, as uh, administrators, as teachers, it may be your thought, your idea that um, there is no afterlife. But for many families, there is such an idea. And um, I'm not sure you as a teacher, board member, administrator, really want to take upon yourself to, to um, jeopardize that student's future, which is something you need to consider. Thank you. Thank you. Valerie and then Randy Marquardt. 
Hello, um, Valerie Brusset, 2465 Country Creek Circle in West Bend. I am a resident and I'm going to jump over to the referendum topic on the agenda tonight. A um, couple of concerns. Um, first of all, I um, was wondering if in the $47 million um, proposed referendum, what would be the total cost of that referendum considering there would be interest on that amount of money. Secondly, I have friends and family who work in real estate and um, they admit that there is a declining um, uh, interest in living in Jackson, which is part of this referendum request to build a new school there. Um, one of the things is, of course, there is a, declining, a decline in the birth rate, but also families who have young children who still have concerns about the 55,000-gallon gasoline spill that was in 2012, 2013. Um, people with young children don't really have um, much interest when they can um, buy homes in other surrounding areas um, with concerns about that gas spill. And second, or thirdly, um, concerns about seeing a plan, a plan for that um, money, where is it going? A plan for the school in Jackson, a plan for the um, the remodel in the high schools. Will that remodel um, include chan transgender bathrooms, transgender locker rooms? What is the plan for those things? Um, and those are all the questions I have. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you. Is Randy here tonight? Randy Marquardt? I somehow have a card for Randy Marquardt. Is he here tonight? That's why I do it too for me, because they were sitting back there. They were from maybe yeah. two weeks ago or before Christmas or something. All right. Anybody else wish to address the board tonight? I would just have a comment. Um, Mr. Kierkegaard, if you could get Valerie the information that she's asking for, the plans, etc. Yes, I, I believe that's on the way. Thank you. Some of the financial aspect of her question I know will be addressed later on tonight, in fact. So. All right, let's move on to our clerk's report. That would be you. <laughs> Three individuals filed candidacy papers by the January 2nd deadline for a position on the Board of Education for West Bend Joint School District Number 1. They are Paul Fisher, Aaron Dove, and Christopher Bach. Our district has a seven-member board with unnumbered seats. Verification of three candidates for two seats on the board has been established. Therefore, according to Wisconsin Statute 120.067 A and B, a primary election will not be required. On Thursday, January 3rd, lots were drawn for position on the April 2nd, 2019 spring election ballot. Candidate names will appear as follows. Number one, Paul Fisher. Number two, Christopher Bach. Number three, Aaron Dove. Great, thank you. On our consent agenda tonight, we have minutes of the December 10th, 2018 regular board meeting, distributions, or uh, disbursements posted to January 14th, 2019, and some resignations. And I will move to approve the consent agenda. Second. Second, any questions on the consent agenda? All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Same sign. Motion carries. We'll move on to our action items tonight. Our first one is the initial resolution authorizing general obligation bonds in an amount not to exceed $47 million. And I think Tim Stelmarker is going to do that. All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, here tonight to assist me with the presentation is John Meehan of R.W. Baird. Uh, our regular contact, Brian Brewer, cannot be here tonight, but he, uh, I, and Superintendent Kierkegaard reviewed all of this data last Wednesday. So without further ado, let's go to the first slide. I'll get it right sooner or later. Uh, the current debt outstanding, 
as many of you already know, the district has actively paid off prior debt from the 2009 and 2012 referendums. And as of today, January 14th, the district has the following principle outstanding. I know it's kind of hard to read that on the um, slides, but I'm hoping all board members have the electronic version. Uh, in Fund 39, that would be referendum approved debt, 29420000 and in Fund 38, that would be non-referendum approved debt, a little over $5 million. An important point is we have budgeted this year $4,800,000 million, uh, $4 million of principal, which will be paid off this year, and the final payment on exi existing referendum <coughs> will be done in 2028. I repeat that point. The final payment on existing referendum debt will be paid off 2028, and that creates a strategic opportunity for structuring new debt. As far as interest cost is concerned, from a business manager perspective, the interest cost is really low at this time. Based on rapid debt retirement, we have taken some of the most expensive debt within the past 12 months and prepaid. Uh, we have ARA stimulus bond subsidies. These are also known as Build America bonds. Give you an example, if we took out debt at 3.5%, the subsidy would be about one5 so the net interest that the district would be paying uh, would be around two. There are several issues that we have right now with outstanding debt that uh, are subsidized. And of course, we still, relatively speaking, are in a low interest rate environment. The next point, the debt outstanding as a percent of equalized property value is less than 1%, 0.66. The statutory limit is 10%. Uh, with my experience in school business management, I've never seen a district that's really approached 10. But I do know also from that experience that 0.66 is one of the lowest percentages in the area. And the last point here on this page, the mill rate for referendum approved debt. That would be if we didn't do anything else in the district but pay our debt would be uh, $1.01 per thousand of assessed valuation. Our total mill rate this year is 7.97. The state average, I believe everyone has heard, is around 9.79. Many districts over 10. And this also is one of the lowest total mill rates in the area. Going to the next page financing goals of the <clears throat> proposed referendum. And it is indeed important to articulate the goals. First, minimize the referendum mill rate increase. And right now we're estimating that to be 13 cents on $1,000 of assessed valuation. We totally want to minimize the financing cost. We want to mitigate, we want to lessen the interest rate risk. And of course, we want to maximize the investment earnings. And with that, I'll give the microphone over to John for uh, the review of the referendum financing assumptions. Thank you, good evening. I'll just walk through some of this information that Tim's leading me to. When calculating um, the impact of any borrowing, you have to start with an assumed bond issue size, borrowing amount. And for purposes of math, we're used to $47 million. You then have to take an estimate as to what the interest rates can be and for the planning purposes, we're using 4.25%. Uh, 
though it's on the uh, a conservative higher estimate, it's an estimate we use at this point for running the math. And as far as the interest rate rates remain low, and uh, you may want to press that point, which Tim had mentioned earlier, uh, this chart uh, looks at a historical reference of municipal bond rates, and it goes back to um, really goes all the way back to eighty nine, nineteen eighty nine, which goes all the way back. And I've been doing this for thirty years, so it's about as long as I've been doing this. As I look at this time period, and you can see on the left side how interest rates have been as high as seven and a half, eight percent for twenty year borrowings and how it is trended lower to the box on the far right side, which is the time period we are in now. And then over the past year, it just shows above. Yes, it's gone up a little bit, but interest rates go up, then they go down. We're fortunate that in Wisconsin, uh, debt issues are well received. Uh, the marketplace appreciates that Wisconsin credits are strong credits, including the, uh, the West Bend School District. Going back to the assumptions, as I mentioned, we use 4.25% for the purpose of running the math. Current interest rates are more in the three and a half to three and a quarter, three quarter range. As interest rate change, like for example, one a 1% reduction, and right now we're saying we have about a half percent cushion, but a 1% reduction in interest rates will have a interest cost benefit of about $7 million. So that's significant over a 20-year time period. The repayment schedule, according to the statutory limitations, is 20 years. That's how long a debt can be issued. We've used a 19-year repayment structure. As we know it's always been the goal of the district to pay off debt sooner rather than the full 20-year time period. So we're actually using a 19-year repayment structure. And we've taken a look at the existing debt that was being paid down with the opportunity to back end load around the debt itself. What we're seeing now is interest rates are um, very flat from the one year to the 20 year time period. The interest rate range is no more than 1% in the first to 20 year. So there isn't the normal, what you'd see as a, a sharp ascending interest cost as far as you go out. So we're able to actually benefit from the existing structure and the current interest rates to uh, structure around the existing debt. But we end up with a level of combined debt service for the debt. Now as far as the property growth, to calculate the mill rate, we're using a 1% growth in valuation. Over the past five years, the average has been 3%. So we've seen an increase in the valuations, but yet for the math, we're using for 1% growth. As far as the referendum tax impact, the referendum amount is $47 million. That is the amount that if you approve the resolutions would be placed on the ballot and would be the dollar amount that would actually be voted on. The question which was asked earlier, the total interest cost using that 4.25% assumed interest rate is $27 million. So similar to one's own mortgage, there's a principal amount you borrow and there's interest on the amount that's being borrowed. So the total of the principal and interest is approximately $74 million. And once again, these are based on estimates at this time, but we do have some cushion in the rates. The increase over the 2018-19 mill rate is 13%, 13 cents. Below, we have taken that because often people will say, well, what does this relate to for a property value that I may have? And so based on different property values, we're saying, what is the annual increase over what the current tax rate is? Turn it back to Tim. And the last slide that we'll cover tonight uh, is absolutely a very interesting one. Uh, in the business office, if we look at our debt structure over the next uh, 10 to 12 years, you see that we go from this year's um, amount of a dollar and one approval of the referendum would bank that 
are estimated 13 cents per thousand. And then over the next 10 or 11 years, the only ones that we have here, but I would expect the trend to continue, there's a slight decrease over time. And of course, those of you in finance know that uh, that is not an absolute number, but and it's not static, but we are always uh, working with our advisors to uh, take advantage whenever we can for, dis for district finances. Um, any questions at all on this presentation? Question on the rates. So you had mentioned you based it on 4.25%. That's um, right. Yeah, for, for the RW Bear gentlemen. So the um, rates about now are 3.5, maybe a two part question. Um, where are the rates going projected wise using your, your companies, which is best guess? And maybe second part of that question what is the difference between 4.25 and 3.5, roughly on $27 million in interest, and maybe we don't have to ask that, but I appreciate having a conservative bend to what you're presenting. Um, let, me, uh, let me go back and, and go forward. Um, as far as the difference, you know, we were saying that a 1% change in, in rates uh, equals about $7 million of interest. Mm -hmm. So you know, that half percent that you're referring to, $3.5 million of interest. As far as uh, where interest rates are going, if I knew with certainty, <laughs> I would still be here. But uh, I would say to you that um, we have we have gone for a long time. If we look at that chart with, with low rates, we saw a number of uh, uh, adjustments to the Fed rates. We uh, have had discussion about going into 2019. They may have two additional adjustments. Um, for, you know, at one point there was expected to be four adjustments. So um, I think it really depends on how the economy goes into the future. And uh, fortunately, uh, once again, municipal rates have been low. Uh, Wisconsin credits are well received in the marketplace. West Bend does have a strong bond rating, and that will make it uh, more attractive uh, uh, for issuers because investors will have greater comfort. Uh, as economic difficulties uh, may cause concern in the marketplace. Thank you. Any more questions? Yes. I know this looks like a very, very, very rosy picture. And it looks like we should approve this and there will be no problems. Everything will go, go along hunky dory. And uh, uh, the West Bend taxpayer will have no problem uh, financing this debt with their taxes. I, however, am one who knows about history. And I do know that there are cycles in our economy. I also do know that those cycles are impacted by elections political changes in the political environment. If we get other administrations who decide that they're going to uh, create a negative business climate, that's going to impact our economy. <coughs> that's going to impact what happens to jobs. It's also going to impact what happens to the valuation of property. Um, I saw that back in 07 and thereabouts. Property values went down. They did not go up. One of the reasons we've got phenomenal property values, or at least increase in property values, is we've got a super great economy. It's on steroids. Um, wages are, are, are going up. We can't find enough workers for all the jobs that we have. That can turn around, and that's what I'm concerned about. I'm concerned about a, a, a cycle like that. And then the West Bend taxpayer ends up uh, with some, you know, it's just not such a rosy picture, is it? Uh, I, 
Um, I just, and then also I have a problem with, and I have been uh, having a problem with uh, the present proposal that it's really being overbuilding, given the, the what was cited before, and I cited also the projections of declining enrollment. Uh, I, I really wonder if we're doing the wisest thing in the world here. Um, I have some grave concerns. Um, looking forward today, if everything would stay the way it is today, fine. I'd have no problems. But I know it's not. I'm a student of history. I got concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Any more comments, questions? <coughs> Superintendent, you got just a quick comment in regards to the question that was asked earlier. We have been in conversation with our CD student as well as with our architects. And if the board chooses to go forward with a referendum, one of the things that we said is an absolute requirement is that we need to know what the scope of the, so that everybody can see what does the future Jackson Elementary look like? What's the size? What are the, the things that go with Jackson Elementary? But even a bigger factor is what will that include at the high school? What what is that? You know, when we talk about increased security, we talk about uh, uh, energy efficiency, we talk about C, uh, our CTE program, we talk about some other things that that don't have that information tonight. But if the board does go forward with a referendum before we go to vote, we know that that is a requirement that our public wants and needs to know so they're actually seeing exactly what they're voting on. And so we will make sure and get that information to you and to the public as quickly as we can if the board chooses to go forward. Yep. Just one other uh, comment, or maybe a question. We are to have transparency as far as the cost of this project. That was my understanding. That's board policy. So that means that the cost, the building cost, the referendum amount should be published along with the total interest cost. Um, so those figures, on, I think on slide uh, five at the top, those should be published. Am I not correct? Or no. But I mean, that when it comes to the referendum, they will be in the referendum. Are you talking, are you asking published in the question itself? Yes. I don't believe that's a decision that the board will make. I don't believe that's necessarily the intent of the, the and I wasn't here, the intent of the, the, the cost of the referendum is to be published and is to be available for everyone. I don't believe that on the way that the current resolution is drafted that the $27 million interest rate would appear on the ballot because we don't know if it's 27 or 22. We don't know that because we don't know what the interest rate is going to be until you sell the bonds after the fact. Having said that, you certainly publish early and often what the projected dollar amount is going to be, but I don't believe that that is on the referendum itself. That, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, I can share a, uh, an, a legal opinion on this. This was an email sent to all board members from uh, former board member Bart Williams, and it's a public record because it was sent to our email, email, so I'm sure he's okay with me sharing this, but this, this is from an attorney who he, he asked legal opinion on this. It said, you, would, you have advised us that a board member is inquired as to whether it is permissible and appropriate to add the cost of financing, and in parentheses, the interest to be paid on the principal amount you are proposing to borrow to your referendum question. The short answer is that it is not. The first step in the referendum process is the passage of an initial resolution. The parameters of what is to be included in an initial resolution are set forth at section 67.05 of the Wisconsin State Statutes and include the purpose and the maximum principal amount of the bond, um, of the maximum, maximum principal amount of the bond issue. An initial, an, an initial resolution is the first step in gaining the authority to borrow money for a specified purpose. 
you only borrow principal. Of course, you will pay interest on that principal amount, and the total cost of the debt service is borne by the taxpayer. The appropriate place to identify the cost is in whatever material the district shares with the community when communicating the facts surrounding the proposed borrowing. It is not permissible to include these costs in the referendum question. Please let me know if you have any further questions concerning this issue. Um, I reached out to Corals and Brady six months ago with this same question. They, and mine was not a documented response like that, it was a phone call, but um, they're the attorneys who helped write the referendum questions. The attorney I spoke with said that basically the same thing and that they've never included interest with any customers districts that they've worked with. So, so then the this information uh, about the total interest or total principal and interest cost will be in the I guess you could say the uh, information that is put out before the public. In my opinion, it should be plastered on our website. Anything that our construction firm puts out, mailer-wise, uh, yes, absolutely. It should be shared, just like we're talking about now, very publicly. There's nothing to hide here. You borrow, you borrow money, you're going to pay interest on it. And like the attorney said, that interest is borne by the taxpayer. It's just not going to be on the question. In looking at the Wauwatosa referendum that was just passed, it was $124 million. Uh, they did not include the information. I mean, they include the information on what the total payments will be, but they certainly didn't include that in the question. So I was reviewing board policy 615, which is disclosure of financing and total cost of all referenda. And uh, rather than read the whole thing, I think the important part is it talks about disclosing the principal dollar of the borrowing, the interest expense, total amount of the referendum, major assumptions and factors. And it discusses two things. First of all, it needs to be available for review by the public upon request. And also, to answer Mr. Schmidt's question, if the proposal is adopted by the board, any additional communications, mail materials, postings, communication to media, presentations at board meetings, other meetings within the community need to disclose those items as well. So it does appear to be an information uh, proposal uh, requirement. More comments on on this topic? Questions? Now that I move to approve the resolution authorizing general obligation bonds in an amount not to exceed forty seven million. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Second. All right, we've got a motion and a second. Further discussion, questions? All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Vote, uh, motion carries six to one. We'll move on to action item B, which is, um, I guess, Don, we've got your name on this one, but uh, it's basically the referendum question, um, which is in one of the attachments. If you can open it, is it working good? This attachment has like 12 different uh, pages to it, yeah. but I think the, the main question is a sample ballot on page 11. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I believe it's actually on page 10 as well. 10 and 11. So it's in the box and uh, I think, I don't know who drafted this document. Is this drafted by Quilty Brady. Okay. So the, the, the box is, and we've all voted before, that's how it would appear on a ballot page that I'm looking at is 11, and I think it would be exactly how it would <laughs> um, show up on a ballot. So I'll, I'll just read it out loud. The question uh, presented to us by Quirles and Brady is, um, should the West Bend, sh shall the West Bend Joint School District Number 1, Washington County, Wisconsin, be authorized to issue, pursuant to Chapter 67 of the Wisconsin Statutes, general obligation bonds in an amount not to exceed $47 million for the public purpose of paying the cost of a school building, an improvement program consisting of construction of a new Jackson Elementary School, safety, security, building infrastructure, technical education, and engineering lab improvements, remodeling and capital improvements at the high school, and acquisition of related furnishings, fixtures, and equipment. And it's a, you simply mark a box, yes or no.
which obviously outlines, as the, as the uh, attorney's opinion that I just read outlines, the scope of, of why you're borrowing the money. Don, do you have any, Superintendent, any exactly, further questions? Exactly what you read, and that will be what's on the balance. As a parent, and two at the high school, unfortunately my kids won't be able to benefit from these updates and renovations. However, I get really excited seeing um, A, the infrastructure. We don't have to have 50 gallon buckets collecting water from the ceiling from the, the pipes. Um, I know we recently got a letter from a woman in Brookfield who had come to her granddaughter's recital performance at the auditorium. And she was so disappointed in the condition of the restrooms that she actually sent an email, well, she sent a letter, a handwritten letter to me, which I gave to Joel, because he was president at the time. But I just thought the, the first impressions of a school, of a building, mean a lot. They mean a lot to the community. And to take the time and invest in restoring some of these areas that are 50 years old, I think is going to be of great benefit. I know. 12 out of 14 showers in the bathroom and the locker rooms at the high school aren't working. There's just multiple things where I think in some ways our kids have become accustomed to it. However, it's definitely time to improve and to attract. I think there's also a relationship between declining enrollment and declining facilities. And people really value uh, a community that will invest in its education and in its students and in its future. So I see this and I'm, I'm thrilled almost to the point of tears, because uh, it's, it's been a while, I think, in coming, but also Jackson Elementary. You talk to families there, you talk to village officials there, and they say, why is it taking you so long? You know, what's the hold up? Let's get on with this. So I just appreciate you bringing this question forward. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be voting in favor of the question as well. Um, I think it's our job to um, tell the public that we have a need right now. And that need is a new building in Jackson, and it's for some major remodels and updates at the high school. And then, of course, it's the pub, pub, it's the public's uh, decision on whether or not they agree with us. And we're presenting the need, and I have the same vote that you know everyone else out there has on this. And so that's why I'm in favor of it's time to we've done the research, and it's time to send it to the public. You all understand what we're talking about here. We're not building a new school in Jackson. We're simply asking the public for the money to do that, and this becomes a ballot question in April um, that your folks and your neighbors will go vote on to decide whether or not we're, we move forward with that question I just talked about. So this doesn't happen every day, so you've come to an interesting meeting tonight. Any further questions, discussion? Just yeah. one comment I had, Joel, because I had asked Dave Ross, one of my big concerns was even what would this mean? Could we save energy dollars? Um, I had asked Dave Ross in a public meeting a couple months ago. Um, appreciate his work and getting two very professional energy service companies to do an assessment of the high school. It's pretty easy to understand Jackson, but to understand the high school and how there's some parts of it in good shape, some parts of it in bad shape. Well, is there money to be saved? Are we getting the most out of our facilities now? Maybe just one point that came back from both of these energy companies was that Dave and his crew, um, all the facilities crew, have been doing a great job on getting energy savings out of the best equipment that we have. That came pretty clear. Um, second point, though, is lighting at the building. Um, we don't have LED lighting in 80 plus percent of the high school. And if it's renovated, um, with things there is energy savings dollars that will be had by the district for lighting improvements at the district but maybe my one point is thanking Dave for doing that study which led to some more clarity on, on scope of work and such so I just wanted to report that back. I move to approve the resolution providing for a referendum election on the question of the approval of an initial resolution authorizing the issuance of general obligation bonds and an amount not to exceed $47 million. Second. Motion and a second. Any questions, further discussion? All in favor, please sit in five by saying aye. Uh, aye. Aye. Any opposed? None. Motion carries seven to zero. We'll move on to our open enrollment capacity. Again. I think. Is Laura Jackson doing that? Yes, she is. She's right there. Thank you. Under state statute, every year a school district um, in, at the first board meeting in January needs to set any open enrollment capacity limits that they intend to um, adhere to the following school year. 
So open enrollment windows start in February, and um, before you, you have the um, proposal, which is exactly the same as last year. Um, we would set open at the capacity, the number of students we could take in as two less than our full capacity to, um, per the program or the grade level. Are there any questions about that? I move to approve setting the open enrollment capacity at two less than full capacity by grade level and or program for the 2019-2020 school year. Second. Okay, there's a motion and a second. Any questions, discussion? All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. We'll move on to deletion of board policy 378, which is public performances by students. So this policy came before, um, before the policy committee previously, and uh, the, the elements of this policy are covered in other district policies. The policy committee was comfortable with moving it forward uh, for deletion. And this is our second reading on this, I believe. I move to approve the deletion of board policy 378, public performances by students. Second. Motion and second. Any questions, discussion? All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Motion carries, seven to zero. Thank you. Uh, we'll go on to our discussion items tonight. Tip. Uh, discussion on Pathways Charter School Review. John Kricker, I'm the superintendent of the West Bend School District. Um, there are times when superintendents need to make difficult decisions and or recommendations. Unfortunately, this is one of those difficult recommendations. This recommendation is not a reflection on the governance council, our teachers, or our students, but it's my recommendation based on information and data, data that is available. If there's any fault in the process, the fault really needs to go back to the district. Difficult discussions, recommendations, and reviews should have been taking place each and every year for the last five years. Earlier today, I met with Anton and Becky to discuss my, my presentation tonight and said that I would make a couple clarifying points before we get started. And, and the first one has to do, and Diane brought it up earlier from the Governance Council, has to do with the independent audit. And um, I'm going to uh, say that when you assume things, you you know what assume does if you break it out, and I made some assumptions that I probably shouldn't have. I was assuming that the uh, independent audit had been widely published and that it was a document that should be used to make difficult decisions, and I don't know if that's 100% accurate. And so that uh, yeah, Diane is correct, and for that I apologize that I truly want you, as you make your decisions, not tonight, but in January, to not look at the independent audit as a, a or independent evaluation as a decision as to whether you should or shouldn't go forward. You can maybe look at it as, are we, is the, the purpose of pathways, are we meeting the goal? Are we doing what we're supposed to with pathways? Is that what we started our charter all about? But but, but there, when I met with Becky and Anton, they did bring up that there was some questions on the process, some questions on the on how we did the evaluation, and so for that reason, that I'm I'm encouraging you. The evaluation is there; it's public document. That if anybody would have asked, that we certainly needed to share that because it was purchased with district funds and available, um, but, but, but I don't want you to use that specifically regarding whether you should or shouldn't go forward with pathways. My presentation is gonna be based on five other elements. And the first one is cost, okay? And so as I look at the cost of the program, I also, it was brought to my attention that I, I made an assumption that I shouldn't have made. When you compare the 16, 17, cost of the program and the 1718 cost of the program those are actual dollars those were dollars that were spent on the program 
okay? In 1819, we have a new business manager, director of finance, and this was her best guess estimate as to what the cost of the program is going to be for the 1819 school year. But it is not fair for me to make an assumption on, on uh, it's not fair for me to make an assumption on the cost if I'm looking at, at actual cost for 16-17, actual cost for 17-18, and anticipated cost for 18-19. You're comparing apples to oranges and that's not that's not okay, okay? But I would say that with that same analysis, the cost per student for both the high school and Badger, as well as the cost per student at Pathway, all three of them are based on the proposed budget for 1819. So the comparison that I show you is a comparison of, of proposed budget to proposed budget to proposed budget, the overall increase, the 28% increase that I made reference to, it, it, is a, it, it might be 28%, but I can't say that for sure because it's based on actual expenses, actual expenses, and proposed expenses, and our actual expenses in the past have been $50,000, $60,000 less than our our, our, our proposed expenses were less than our actual. So, so that number certainly might go down, and if it goes down, it still doesn't necessarily reflect the overall difference between the budgets because the budgets are based on projected expenses across the board. And so the per student expense for pathways based on the proposed expense is about $10,926 per student. That compares to $6,356 for Badger and $6,000, $6,019 for the high school. That's $4,500 more per student at Badger and $4,900 per student at the high school. When I looked at the budget numbers, I figured in the soft cost for the Badger and high school. And so in those numbers, there's already the cost built in for the cost of the superintendent, the cost for the director of finance, the cost for HR. None of those dollars are figured into the cost for pathways. Those are just actual expenses. And so if you were to try to compare dollars and you provided equity for all the buildings, you would need to increase the budget for the Badger by about $4 million. If you were going to say we're going to spend about $10,000 per student, you're going to increase the budget significantly. If you're going to do that for the high school, it's about $11 million increase based on the number of kids and the difference in the per student cost. So, um, but I wanted to make sure that as I present the information, I am not misleading because that was not my intent and uh, Anthony, or uh, the, our teachers brought it up to me and uh, they said, you're right. And so I will make sure and emphasize that tonight when I do my presentation. When I looked at enrollment, that's the next slide that I have, it shows that we currently have 58 students at Pathways. And we've had a six year high of 69 students in a low of 45 students. And so when you figure out the actual FTE, because none of the students are full-time, it comes out to a enrollment of 37.49 students. Because the, the middle school students are counted as seven-ninths of a student because they take two classes at the, at the middle school and the high school students are counted as for sevenths because they take three classes at the high school. So our overall enrollment is 56, our FTE is 37.49. Might it go up significantly? Yes, certainly might. Have we done a great job of promoting pathways? That was pre me and I can't tell you what has and hasn't been done to promote pathways. I can tell you that 
when the initial pathways presentation, when the, the charter was initially approved, they anticipated or they at least projected based on the charter of about 150 students at this point in time. So at, at, we're not close to that. Could we get there? Probably. But we haven't got there as of yet. And so when I say that, if there's any fault, it may be relied, goes back to the district. I don't know if it's ever been spelled out to the Pathways Governance Council that we have a projected enrollment of 150 and we need to, to figure out where we're at. Okay? I don't know if that's ever been a discussion. I don't know if it's ever been a discussion in that you're spending $4,000 more per student at Pathways than if you are at, at Badger. And if that discussion didn't take place, it's hard to hold somebody accountable if you don't know that they're going to be held accountable for it. So I understand that. I'm just giving you the, the hard data numbers. When you go to uh, letter C, which is the student performance, in that particular case, I am citing that our student performance has, according to the test results, according to the state report card, we went from two years ago exceeds expectations to last year meets expectations to this year meets expectations of few. There was discussion earlier, and I certainly don't disagree with that. There are lots of things that you look at when you determine the success of a school. Unfortunately, test results in the state of Wisconsin are one of the key elements. Okay. In addition to that, in our charter, it does say that they will exceed, meet or exceed the, the results of their peers in the middle school and the high school. I don't believe that that's the case. And so if you have specific questions regarding the testing performance, the student achievement, I'm going to turn those questions over to Jennifer Ginnerman or, or Laura because they'll do a better job of explaining that. Um, the fourth one is anticipated change in the location. And I said that uh, we have been in the mutual ball on Main Street since its inception in 2013. That option is no longer available. So no matter what we do for next year or what the board does for next year, a new location is required. And so with that new location, you really have three different options. You have the option of finding another site off campus, similar to where we're at now, but a different spot. You can move the, the, the location back to maybe the middle school, or you move it back to the high school. Those are the three options that you have. When Mr. Ross did a little bit of investigating, he came up with a, a cost of about $1,000 a square foot, or $1,100 a square foot, if you find another spot off, off campus. And so if you look at a 5,000 square foot facility in 12 months, you're looking in that fifty-five dollars to $65,000 range for um, rent plus renovation plus heat and plus the other things. And so that drives the cost up even farther. I do believe Mr. Ross took some of the Pathways um, Board of Directors on a tour and at least looked at a room or two at Badger. I do not know if they looked at a room or two at the high school, but those really are your three options. Um, so um, I've already addressed the independent audit, and I apologize because I assumed that that was, you know, if I'm going to bring somebody in to evaluate, then I'm going to use that evaluation as part of my my research, my information, and, and, but you know, there was some questions on whether we use the right tool, whether the evaluation is 100% accurate or not, whether that information has been shared as readily as it should have been shared, and so as you make your decision, I'm encouraging you to not look at the independent audit as one of your rationale unless you want to look at it for the sole purpose of 
is there a disconnect between why kids are going to pathways and what the charter is all about? And that is my my sixth area, or the last one, is a possible disconnect between where we're at and why kids are there. And there's no question, not any, that our teachers, our Pathways program, has done an excellent job of providing opportunities for our kids. I, I don't think anybody can question that at all, that, that there are kids who have been successful, who are successful, just because of the nurturing environment that Pathways has provided. Having said that, that's not necessarily what the overall mission of Pathways was all about. Okay? We might need to look at a charter school, or excuse me, a alternative school at both the middle school and high school because we're obviously missing some of the needs for our kids. Okay, But I'm not so sure that our mission for Pathways is designed centered around an alternative school. The mission for Pathways is to provide a collaborative environment with the community that integrates academic rigor in the effort for career and post-secondary success. And so paraphrasing a little bit, but it's academic rigor and that leads to career and post-secondary success. That's not necessarily an alternative school, that's the mission. And with that mission, they have three pillars, project-based learning, individualized learning plans, and career-based learning. And so, so um, I, I truly want to emphasize that I, I understand where all of the parents, the kids, have been talking about their overall commitment, their success, and how proud they are to be part of Pathways, and the overall, perf you know, the what our teachers have done for the kids at Pathways. They've done a great job. It just, is there a disconnect between what Pathways were, was established to do and what Pathways is currently doing. And, and that's not a Don decision, it's a Don. Don's responsibility is to provide you with the information. When I talked to uh, Anton and Becky this afternoon, what I did say was that tonight is strictly discussion information, discussion. No actions will be taken, okay? The board has a couple opportunities, options, you can do a, a, a work session if you want, okay, and do that um, before we have our meeting on the 28th, or at a minimum, when you have a discussion item, excuse me, an action item on the 28th, you need to invite some of our Pathways instructors or our Pathways charter members to have them come up and say, you know what, Mr. Kierkegaard presented this information, and we appreciate the fact that he presented this information, but this is our side of, of what's happening. And so I, it's not fair for me to have the last and only say at, the, at that meeting. You truly need to get some input as well, and whether you get that input in a, a work session beforehand, or at a minimum, you get some input at the meeting, not necessarily in the public comments. They can certainly have public comments as well, but you want to have the opportunity to ask questions specifically of individuals just like you would want to ask questions of, of Don and or Laura and or Jim. And so that concludes my part of it and uh, would be gladly answer any questions you might have if they're centered around academic performance. I'm going to bring Jen up there. If they're centered around the independent audit, I'm going to bring Laura up. Nancy. So I have that look on my face. I, I was just grabbing that microphone ready to go. Okay, so several comments. Um, first, I would suggest that we do a work session, and I would love to have as many students and their families and uh, governance board uh, members there so we can have um, conversation. I do agree with you that there does seem to be um, disconnect as to the original what a charter school is versus perhaps what our students need. My bigger concern is, I'm sorry, I don't remember if the number was 54 or 58, how are we going to ensure those students that they're going to receive the same level or close to the same level 
um, experience that they're getting now. Obviously, these students feel that they're doing better at pathways than they feel that they would do at, at Badger or the high school. So how do we, I, I'm not in favor of just throwing these kids back into the uh, larger school setting that they were clearly uncomfortable with to begin with. So I, I, you know, your comment about an alternative school, I think I'd like more information on what does that look like, how does that appeal to these students, what does that do budgetarily? I mean, as a school board, we make a lot of tough decisions. And it's, it's very difficult to hear you say, gee, we're spending $4,000 more per student at Pathways. I'm not so sure that's fair to all the students. Then. I mean, we have to look at some way to be more fair, but we also have to look at trying to meet their needs. So I guess I would ask you to prepare more information about what an alternative school looks like, because I'm not really very familiar with that, and I don't know if most board members are, are either. So. So, so no matter what, if the board chooses to not go forward with the charter, okay, there's 56 students at Pathways that we need to make sure that we're addressing their needs. Some of them will graduate, some of them are seventh graders going to be eighth, some are eighth going to be ninth, but there are also uh, juniors are going to be high seniors as well, and sophomores are going to be juniors, and we need to make sure that we address all of their needs, okay? I have said all along that this is not a monetary recommendation by Don to save $400,000. That's not it, okay? Because I anticipate at least to begin with, the lion's share of that is going to be used to make sure that we're providing the type of programming necessary at the high school. You know, if, if you have project-based learning and you're a <coughs> senior and you've got these credits, we need to figure out how you're going to get the, the rest of the credits so that you can be successful. And so we, we're, we're going to have to add some special classes, we're going to have to do some things there to make sure that that we're providing what we need to provide so that we can have a smooth transition from 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 pathways to the high school or back to the middle school. That's one part of it. The next part of it is, you know, how what does a alternative school look like at the high school? How do that's a bigger picture. And in and, and maybe pathways, the charter school concept is put on hold for a little bit, and we come back with a different charter school concept. We can't, by the nature of our charter, go in and redo the Pathways Charter. That doesn't work that way, okay? It's either the charter or it's not. You can tweak the charter a little bit, but you're not gonna go from here over to here because DPI has to approve that, okay? And that's, I, I believe, and, and Laura's more of an expert on that than I am, but that's too late for that. That ship has already sailed. Can't do that for next year. But that doesn't mean to say there aren't other types of charter availability. I think I shared with some of you, I went over to Kettle Marine uh, before Christmas, and they have three charter schools right in their high school. One is on science, uh, it's uh, health and science. One is on, on um, performing arts, and the third one is on uh, international studies and they have a phenomenal program one that we certainly can have as well and I'm not saying that we don't have have great things happening at pathways as well but their program is more spelled out as to what their goals are in each particular area and in their case they're all at the high school and they believe it's critical that they be at the high school because it allows kids to take a high school class if they need to. And so for, for um, international studies, if they want to take another foreign language that's not offered at their charter school, they can just walk down the hall and take it over here. Or for the math class, if they don't have enough critical maths to take this kind of math, then they can enroll in another math class over here. You know, the project-based learning that we do very effectively at Pathways is a means to the end, is not the end. Project-based learning is a, a teaching mechanism that all of our students, whether they're at Pathways or they're at the high school or they're at Badger, should be explored, ex exposed to because it's a very, very effective way to teach kids. Just as computer-aided instruction is, just as, as interdisciplinary units are, just as sometimes the, the 
lecture in front of the kids. And they're all, they're all teaching mechanisms that you use to get to the end. And project-based learning certainly is a very effective tool that they're using effectively at Pathways. But we should be doing that in all of our buildings. And so Nancy, to go back to your question on battling, is that uh, immediately we need to make sure that we address all of the concerns of everyone who is in pathways, that we have our counselors, we have our principals working on how do we make sure that we have the classes available so that we're not leaving kids out. That's the first part. But the second part is they went, some of them, not all of them, some of them went to pathways because they felt that was a great environment for them to have a different educational setting. If we don't have that environment, then are we going to have them go through the cracks? And that's what nobody, nobody wants that to happen. Do we have location space? Do we have space at Badger at the high school? I, I do, based on conversation, we'll have to make some things happen. Based on conversations with Mr. Ross, we could make that happen either at the high school or at Badger. Um, yeah, we're going to have to redo some things. It's because it's in order to have an effective charter school it's not just taking a classroom and say you know this thousand square foot is now you, you need to do some things that that provide for a different learning environment and so it's going to require some time and effort but i believe the space is available especially as we have looked at some declining enrollments going forward that we can utilize some of the space that's currently over there the current location is absolutely not an option correct? from my understanding visiting with the the city as well as the charters uh, board that we've all been told that the current location is not an option. They're going to do something different with that. And if we choose to do something in a def different location off campus, we're probably going the wrong direction in our cost because the city has given us a very, very favorable uh, arrangement for the renting. And so if you look at the, the cost of transportation from the school to pathways. You look at the cost of rent from the school for the school to rent pathways facility. And this year we added another twenty-five thousand dollars to the budget because we didn't have the personnel to, or could we hire the personnel to do our cleaning? So we had to contract out all of our custodial service for pathways as well. So if you look at those three things. Transportation, custodial, and um, overall rent, you probably are looking at a sixty to seventy thousand dollar shift in cost just in those three things. I think the other option also looking at going to the high school in the bedroom, and there were there were also very serious concerns that were brought up by this board about security and, and you know having locked secured entrances and that type of thing. So that um, concern uh, would be met then with the same protocol that we have at Badger in the high school. So just pointing that out. I'm in favor of a work session, um, you know, maybe next week. I, I, obviously our next meeting is two weeks from tonight. Um, I, I'm partially in agreement with Nancy that I think having the teachers, um, the staff or pathways, uh, governance council members, I'm not sure that we need to have a bunch more students or parents. I, I personally, I feel like we've heard from the, the students and the parents. My questions for next, you know, if we are able to have a uh, board work, work session would be, you know, directed towards the teachers and towards the governance council and talking to them about, you know, are we, are we crystal clear that location, for instance, is not, staying there is not an option. Um, you know, talking about cost, is there is there some way we can start reducing the cost for people? Those sort of questions. So that's why I'm, I'm not I'm not certain that I, you know, that we need to have a, a bunch of students and parents participate in, in that type of a work session. But I would like to have the, the Pathways Governance Council and staff. Next week is Martin Luther King Jr. Day. We have school that day, not for kids, but we do for for staff development teacher training, okay? Uh, so I'm not, so, you know, the 28th is gonna be here before we know it. And so you can do it on the 28th before the board meeting. The downside is you don't have an opportunity to digest what was said because you're gonna go from a 
5 o'clock work session to a 6.30 board meeting to make a decision. So next week is the best time. And so as you go forward, you have, you know, I, I can't work around the, the, the high school because there's an activity every night there. And some of you are going to have kids who are going to be involved with that. But, but, but Monday, more than likely, is going to be a pretty free day based on, on um, the, the kids aren't in school. That, 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 that may be an opportunity for, for Monday the, the 21st for that work session. You tell me what your thoughts are. Or, or Tuesday, Wednesday, I mean, um, and you know, um, the end of the week, we ha I have the um, school board's meeting in Milwaukee as well as school administrators. If I, uh, I will certainly come back early for that meeting because I need to be here for that. Uh, my personal opinion, Mondays typically work for me. Um, and being that we're scheduling a meeting just one week out, fully understand if other board members can't make it. I don't know if it's even going to be possible what day we pick next week if everyone can make it or not. But And we can call into um, uh, board work session. So. Well, I, I think you need to check with the uh, right. pathways people, right. obviously. Right. I don't think it's just our choice. And, right. and I guess just to clarify my statements, I, I certainly didn't mean that we wanted to allow for 58 students and their parents to speak to us, but I want them to be able to be in the audience to hear sure, what's absolutely. being said. And I would invite you all to attend, because um, I think it's important for you to hear what is said and, and what the thoughts are from the board and your governance committee, your council, pardon me. So I will visit with Pathways uh, um, to find out, Monday will be our first preference. If that doesn't work, then Tuesday will be our second choice. Sure, so we'll, we'll go from there, see what happens. I, I would assume, and like I said, I already got in trouble with making the first assumption, but, but I'm going to do it again. I, I know that they will do everything they can to be part of this discussion. And so, so I will invite to be at the table um, Laura and Jen, because they're more knowledgeable on X in the past than I am, as well as our teachers from Pathways and several of the Board of the governance council from pathways to be there and let everybody know it's a open meeting typically with a work session you center the the discussion around those who are at the table as opposed to a opportunity for um, lots of interaction back and forth would that be so 5 30 6 o'clock what time works best i'm going to 5 5 30 on Monday is what we'll shoot for. Okay, and I, I guess I'd ask you know my fellow board members if there are specific topics or questions for anybody who, you know, school district administrators or pathways, email those to, to Don maybe and uh, um, make sure you start you know putting putting your thoughts on in questions and we can get them addressed ahead of time. I just you know this. In my short time on the board, I think will be one of the toughest decisions I will ever have to vote on. And so the most information we can get from both pathways and the district will be extremely important. And, uh, um, you know, we'll, we'll continue the discussion next week. Yeah. Just one more quick question, Don. Do we current, we do not have an alternative school. So we have a charter school, but we have some credit recovery kind of programs, correct? But we do not have a true alternative high school or middle school. Correct. Thank you. And then I'd just like to, um, for the board, but it's also public, can certainly access this information. The February 26th meeting of this year, uh, Laura Jackson provided a number of different files. And one of them was um, the National Association of School Charter Authorizers, the principles and standards of what quality authorizers, um, how, how they act, what they look for, uh, how they seek effective, efficient, programming and such, it's a really useful handout because it's a, a frame of reference for what does a high quality charter school look like. Um, along those lines, I, I, I guess I had the perspective, my daughter started at Pathways as a seventh grader the first year that Pathways started, and we were attracted to the program really based on the marketing by T.C. Motskis, who was the administrator at that time, seeking the motivated, avid learner, no discipline problems, focus, and wants to move ahead, much like Connor shared tonight, get it, getting that extra jump. 
she was one of probably the 21 kids that came back um, within, really, she stayed two or three months because she missed her peer group. She missed her friends back at Badger. But that same time that she came back is when a bipartisan bill passed that allowed for kids at Badger to get high school credit to move if their, um, if, if their benchmarks on tests were around 90% or above, these kids were able to move at a pace faster than some of their peers. And for her, it met her needs the way Pathways has met you know, some of the students' needs as well. But in addition to that, when we talk about duplication of services, and we do this in healthcare, if I'm, I'm an OT, and if I'm providing services that the PT is, do, is doing, the physical therapist, Medicare is not gonna reimburse for that. I feel like we are providing right now, and this is partly because the charter school has been very successful at showing us what does career clusters look like? What do pillars of careers, what do these um, options within the community look like? So now we have the most kids ever their senior year in apprentice positions, in internship positions. Some of that is also based on the advances that were made at Badger to allow kids to move at a different pace. Um, but just to look at it from a place of engagement, these kids are more engaged now at Badger and at the high school, and they're able to get out of their brick and mortar and experience real life scenarios. Um, dual enrollment credits, college, early college credits, all these things have come to fruition within the past six years since the development of the charter. And that's where I see what we're doing statewide for college and career. They did it pathways, they set the standard, but now we are incorporating that very well, I believe, within Badger and within the high school. So regardless of how this turns out, I want to encourage the students that there are so many more opportunities available now. I mean, my daughter graduates this year um, than when Pathways originally started, and part of that is uh, the, the standard that they set. But I don't know, that might be a lot of rambling. <laughs> but do, please look at the standards and principles of authorities of authorizers because we have that job to do and that comes from Harvard 26. The other thing I did, I went to Board Docs and I did a total search since March of 2012 of everything related to Pathways in discussion. One of them was Ted Knightsky's original um, contract when it was passed on January 28, 2013. He does say the second year per student cost will be $4,020, um, significantly lower even than the 6,000 that, that schools are. So the board that approved this really did approve it with the cost being quite a bit lower than the traditional public school setting. In addition, they make it very clear, the contract spells out the expectation that student achievement be at or above the district average, while the per pupil cost is below the traditional school setting cost. So these are just all kind of the objective, um, original intents of the contract. So, so when Tiffany's brought up um, Laura's, it was 2018, I believe, not mm -hmm. 2019, so it would... It Maybe Deb could send just that file to all board members that we know to review it before next week's workshop. Any additional questions for me or for, I have Laura here as well, and she's more of an expert in this area, or at least some of the area than I am, and also have, have um, uh, Jennifer Getterman here as well, and she's our testing guru as far as the testing results. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Nancy and I were uh, just talking about the high school students who are here tonight for the government class. If you guys would like to politely and quietly uh, leave, that would be just fine for us. Um, Administrators in the back can sign yeah, your slips. Everybody in the back can sign your slips for you. You're welcome. We know you have exams. Go <laughs> study. Thanks for being here. Uh, we are going to move on with our meeting, so um, we'll turn it over to Chris for our first reading of the uh, Port, Port Policy 185.1. Okay, so uh, as Joel mentioned, this is a first reading of Policy 181.5, and this comes from the Policy Committee. I'll just hit the highlights of this of this change, and I think part of it was policy was originally created in 2012. Hard to believe seven years have passed, but technology has changed as well as I think common meeting practice. And so uh, you'll note that the policy, uh, as proposed, does not does not change the requirement that it is expected that school board members be physically present at all meetings. Uh, and we'll talk about some additional changes in a second, but that that remains the same. 
I'll point out these changes. Um, the policy referred to teleconferencing. We also added video conferencing since that's a new technology that's available. The old policy allowed, allowed participation electronically by um, at regular meetings and work sessions uh, and special board meetings, but did not allow committee meetings. And the thought was that the committee meeting should be added as well as a permissible uh, meeting to attend uh, electronically. Uh, the other item is, you'll note that teleconferencing in the original policy is not to be allowed for the annual meeting, and that remains the same, as well as closed sessions, expulsion hearing, disciplinary hearings. Uh, but we added meetings of electors as a meeting class that is uh, where virtual attendance would not be allowed. Sorry, I'm jumping back and forth here. Uh, and then the last item is at the bottom, there was a provision that talked about board members not participating in meetings via teleconference for more than four meetings. And the thought was that we should consider removing that for a number of reasons. First one is, if a board member would miss more than four or five, I don't think it's in the power of this board to fire a board member, and that instead really is left to voters' privilege. The other problem is it puts, it puts a board member in a bit of a dilemma because the only remedy after four times is simply to miss the meeting, which seems very unproductive. So these are the items for uh, consideration in this uh, policy, and I believe this is the first reading. First reading, yep. Any questions or comments on this? If not, we will bring it back in two weeks for the second reading and possible vote. Great, thanks. Moving along, um, discussion on the WASB uh, Delegate Assembly Resolutions. Um, this is quite a document that was sent out through board docs. Uh, I've chatted with Don about these resolutions. They're very typical, I guess, uh, annual type resolutions. Um, if you have had time to read them or want to discuss any of them tonight, we can do that. I think Deb did a nice job of highlighting the topics of each resolution. Um, now, I was uh, volunteered, or I volunteered myself to be the delegate next Wednesday at 1.30 to cast our vote. Unfortunately, I now have to be out of town, so I cannot go. Um, if anybody on the board would like to serve as our delegate to go cast our vote at 1.30, on Wednesday next week, the 23rd. I can do it. Can you do it? I, I'm saying that, yeah, Wednesday at 1.30. Correct. And Don, are you going to be there Thank Wednesday? You. And I, I, I was reading the official notice. I believe you can serve as our delegate as well, and uh, a designee. And so if you can't do it, uh, the way I read it is um, the, the president or clerk of the public can designate you as our delegate. So, Tiffany, I really appreciate that. I was going to have to, thought I was going to have to beg, but uh, <laughs> if you're available, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, and if not, then we'll just communicate with Don and Deb and make sure we're represented. So, any questions around Wasby next week? No. I would, yeah. I would just point out for the board, the 1910 is kind of interesting. It was recently in the news how the Racine, um, the city of Racine, their mayor put uh, little additions into the tax bills so that there is a clear awareness of how much money is going towards vouchers, how much money is directed to the city, how much money is being directed to, I think it was Gateway Technical College, is there in Racine, and, and this proposal is one that just to increase the transparency so the entire community is aware of how are your taxpayer dollars allotted between public schools, between private schools, and between other um, amenities within your community, it might be something in the future that I, I would love to see in West Bend and just across the state. You also see 1919 and 1920, your early college credit, your, your dual credit, is a suggestion that the state increases um, reimbursement for those programs. And I know we've acknowledged that those are pricey to our district, but it's so important that the money is really being used within the classrooms, and this is giving students a leg up. So I, I appreciate the fact that they're recognizing schools are providing some great services to get kids moving, but it might be nice if the state can assist in some of this it's at least a request, and then there's a lot of emphasis on the mental health and trauma, um, trauma care for children and such as well. Yeah. Good. Thank you, Tiffany. Any more comments, questions? Waspy. We'll move on to our uh, high school and uh, high school, college, and career center report, Mr. Schwass. No. <laughs> Jennifer Martin. <laughs> Thank you. 
Mr. Schwab's had to go and uh, spend, pick up one of his children. Oh. So, um, when um, Lois Pellegrini um, retired in September, we needed to fill that spot in the College and Career Center, and all of you who know Lois know that was a big shoes to fill. And um, while Lois, at, right after she left, we had Maya Meyer, who is um, a support staff member in the College and Career Center, who did a great job of keeping that going while we were in the process of looking for somebody to, um, to step into that role. And we are very fortunate to have Amy Richter, who was formerly with MPTC, who has um, stepped into that role in our College and Career Center. And because of um, all of the things that we do with when we're looking at um, you know, the early college now and the start college, um, early college credit, start college now, um, all of the opportunities with our military, with colleges coming in, with field trips, and with our ACP plan that is required by the state, um, I asked Amy if she would come, now that she's been here for a few months and have, has kind of gotten her feet wet, um, to talk about what is um, going on in the college and career center. Thanks for being here, Amy. Thank you. Um, so, coming in um, at the end of October, I've been able to see some different things that are going on with the college, in the College Career Center, getting some um, input from teachers and counselors and things like that, but then being at Murray Park for 12 years, um, I kind of indirectly work with the College and Career Center because that person was always my uh, contact at the high school. So I've been able to see um, the progression of the College and Career Center for several years, um, but just the last few months actually being there. So when I came in, um, I kind of created some goals for myself, some direction, um, looking at what's currently being done and what kind of things that I think would be um, kind of need to see happen. Um, so one of the things that I saw is um, a little bit of a lack of knowledge of the College and Career Center with some of the students and things like that. So um, I'm calling it creating a marketing plan, both internal and external, making sure parents and students know that I'm there and the types of services that we can offer and help them with. Um, so we're kind of creating that. And then incorporating the College and Career Center into the culture of the high school. Um, so instead of being a separate entity, what can we do to kind of get anyone out there in the classrooms? How can we help set up business tours? Um, they're doing job shadowing and assignments and classes. So how can I help with contacts um, at businesses? Um, there's a program called Is Your American Dream Achievable at, a local, at another high school. And um, that's where students are looking at their um, career options and what they're interested in and then incorporating that into um, the classrooms and talking with the teachers about that this is what you want to do, that's great, how are you going to get there? So helping um, kind of get that started in the classroom and things like that uh, The other thing is when I'm looking at ACT data, um, we see undecided program, or undecided students, the highest in the career, career choice, um, next being healthcare. So looking at a program, what can we do to help those undecided students a little bit more? That's you know, the obvious goal is to help them figure out a career, but what direction do they want to go, even if they don't know when they graduate, the, the minute they walk out of the high school, what they want to do, how can we help them kind of with some sort of direction. Um, and then I created a spring speaker series for this spring semester, um, where I'm bringing back alumni, showing the students, these, these students that actually graduated from here a year, 10 years ago, where are they, what are they doing, how did they get there, maybe they graduated with this idea in their head and then they're doing something completely different now and that's okay or they didn't know what they wanted to do, or they're in the military, or whatever the case may be. So I had two speakers last week, um, one for the ROTC, and then one is currently able to be the sophomore um, in mechanical engineering at UW Platteville. So she came back to talk about her college. And I have um, electricians, and welders, and um, neuropsychologists, and all kinds of range of different people coming in. So I'm very excited about that. And then looking at what I can do for our next fall semester, kind of having a theme. We use career cruising. Um, this is something that we'd like to get more of the students on board with. They start using it in middle school. So how can we continue to help them to use career cruising? There's a lot of different um, career assessments in there, um, interest inventory is what they are interested in, and then academically what is kind of a good fit for them, or skill-wise what's a good fit for them. Um, we have a reality day, and just through conversations, I discovered that they're using ONET, a career assessment in ONET, which is great. Um, but we have a career assessment in career cruising. We're trying to get one of our students to use it. So I had somebody from Inspire Washington County come in and train our two personal finance teachers um, on career cruising. So the students this next semester 
we'll be using the career assessment and career cruising so we can get more of those students um, back into career cruising, um, building their education plans, their career plans, um, and then also with that building their resumes, they can build a lot of career cruising too. And then Inspire, which is a bolt on. Um, that's another great tool for the students to be able to use. It's the community connection. Um, so we have the community-based learning experiences, job shadowing, career mentors, um, career interviews, business tours, and guest speakers. So any of the career areas, we have local business people that are willing to do any number of those things, whether it be a job shadow or just a career, in, um, not just, but a career interview with a student. So in order to use Inspire, the students have to be in career cruising. So we're um, helping them to be able to access our local businesses and then um, be able to gain some experiences that we so these are just some of the things that we do with college-bound students. We have monthly or semester college visits. Um, we'll be taking college tours to UWM Washington County, UWM, and then Marine Park. Um, UWM and Marine Park will be for juniors and then the undecided seniors coming up the spring semester. Um, again, the spring one next series, we're bringing students who are currently in college. Um, we'll be bringing, be bringing two students um, specifically talking about this was my first year of college. How did it go? They'll be coming in May to talk to the seniors um, about what to expect. Um, and then we have scholarship searches and applications, staff assistance, and then college application process. And then career bound students, we have the opportunity to set the job shadow. We have kind of a formalized uh, job shadow program that I put into place where they're doing. Um, you know, sending out their thank yous and getting permission from their teacher or from their parents, um, kind of organizing their plan, their questions, how they're going to go out to the community and represent the high school, and be sure to do it in a respectful manner so that we're building positive relationships with those um, business owners or the business people in our area. So we talk about that before we just kind of let them loose out to the businesses. Um, again, this spring alumni series. Um, Job posting board, we have on those outside of the career center, so the students will come and there's different jobs ranging from something at Cisco that's a little bit um, more manufacturing, let's say, related, or Hankerson's has a job posting out there for somebody who's interested in, um, in culinary, so there's different um, ranges of different jobs out there. The career assessments that I talked about, if they're not sure what they want to go to school for or what they want to do, um, we help them figure out kind of a, a little bit of a... Um, uh, direction and then we can talk about labor market information as well and then military we have the military recruiters coming in um, monthly from all the different branches we give the ASVAB that'll be twice a year we get that um, once in October I believe it was and it'll be again in March um, we're having a military signing day February 6th um, where we're bringing in the students who we have decided to enlist thus far um, so we'll be uh, celebrating Hopefully the media will be there, as well as families celebrating with students going into the different branches of the military, um, just celebrating their, their successes and their decision to go into the military. I'd love to be invited to that. Absolutely. I'm sure the rest of the board would too. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Um, and then we're going to be bringing in a flight simulator. Um, the Air Force is bringing that in. So anybody? I'd love to be invited yeah. to that too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they're hoping to have that there for a full day so that anybody can come and do it. Again, it's bring alumni speaker series. We bring in people from the military. Um, and then um, incorporating program ideas into classroom curriculum. So the uh, the Navy, they have a nuclear power um, presentation or program that they were trying to get into one of our physics or into our physics classrooms to talk about nuclear power and what does that mean um, in relation to what you're learning about in your classes. And then the ACP tie, um, I'm the a member of the ACP Gold Team, so we create a monthly ACP lesson for um, the teachers to teach in the resource on mandatory Monday once a month, um, relating to either academic, career, um, college, whatever it ends up being, or some sort of tie to all of those things, and then um, breaking it down by freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, what that means to them. For example, interviewing, um, is that a scholarship interview, is that a job interview, so we talk about some interviewing skills. This is one of the examples. Um, we're going to be working on creating activities and timeline for the current ACP, ACP plan um, by grade, again, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. When they graduate or when they um, complete that, that grade or that um, year, 
what kind of activities, what kind of goals do they need to have met according to the ACP plan, and then what activities do we have them doing and serving our teachers because we know a lot of the teachers are currently doing things and we just maybe don't even know that they're doing, so how can we compile those things together and, and create that list of activities. Um, and then really fo focusing our activities on ACP related topics and making sure that that's kind of our goal and our theme. Any questions for Amy? A lot of great stuff. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have a question. Sorry. How, how hard is it to get uh, alumni to come back and speak? To get the alumni? Yeah. Um, some are really excited about it. Um, the younger ones tend to be more excited about it. Um, we're having them speak during resource hour from 9 to 9 30, so that's a little bit harder with their jobs. Um, but I've had quite a uh, I, a large handful of um, alumni that are very excited to come back. Um, it's more so getting the, the students to come see them. Okay, that's the hard thing. Yeah. Great, thank you. I do have an email ready to send to you about the military day when Amy and I talked about that. I knew that that would be something that you would be interested <laughs> in and I will um, CC Deb on that so if you do choose to come you will make sure Deb knows so that if we have what is it, four or more of you there, that um, that can be posted as well. <clears throat> the other thing is with career cruising that Amy has talked about, um, students, once they graduate, have access to that for five years. So when you're thinking about you know scholarships that you may apply for, um, once you've started college, having all that information in one place is, is just an amazing resource. And so the more we can get our students to um, delve into that, whether they're looking at a career or a, a technical school or a four-year college, it's really important um, that we tap into that. And now that we have um, Brenda with um, Washington County Inspire, who's worked with um, Amy quite a bit, and then also with our high school counselors, um, I think that it's just a, an awesome resource for us to keep um, in, you know, encouraging parents to also encourage their students to look at. Great. Great. Thank you, Amy. Thanks for being here tonight. Our district continuous improvement plan update. Jen Gitterman. Good evening, everyone. I just need a minute just to switch over. And I have other team members with me tonight. Oh, boy. <laughs> Thanks for being here tonight, John. Oh, no problem. <laughs> I thought we were the only thing on the agenda. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh. On a serious note, though, what we have to share with you tonight is very exciting. Um, at the end of last year in summer, we um, started our work together as far as drafting those goals and strategic actions for our district. Um, as Mr. Kierkegaard came on board, we had many more conversations um, with him as far as the details as well as um, the U.S. School Board. At that time, we also shared that image of the triangle um, to really um, focus, help us see our mission and vision and the work that we'll be doing throughout the year. The purpose of tonight is really to update um, each of you on our strategic actions and just celebrate and tell you all the good things that are going on. There's some things we've had to revise just as any part of continuous improvement, and so we'll be sharing that as well tonight. Um, John Graff is here from Green Tree. He'll be sharing a little bit more tonight about what is it like um, in the continuous improvement process, like a day in the life at the school? And Lance Rell is here from Silverbrook. He'll be sharing a little bit more about um, the alignment from the district to the school lens. And both these principals are a great partner in all the strategic planning that we do so that we're hitting it from the district level as well as the school level. Throughout the presentation, you'll see colors, and I just want to um, share with you the colors up ahead of time. Um, when we look at our strategic actions, it's really important for us as an effective team to say, you know, whether green, we're on target to meet our goal, yellow, we're in progress. Um, red, maybe we need to revise the strategy, or it's something that we've chosen to discontinue for one reason or another. I also want to point out too is that um, the information that we use use to develop the goals, our planning for this really starts in summer in late spring. And so now this is just that time for that update. And then what we'll be doing is coming back around not only an update on the strategic actions at the end of the year, but also our results once we get um, that student information in. Um, the goals were already shared with you, so I'll just highlight a few and then I'll spend a little bit more time on the strategic actions. 
So in the area of student learning, um, we have identified uh, English language arts goals for third through eighth, as well as specific grade level um, cohorts down below for grade level two. And those grade levels are third, sixth, and eighth. In addition, in the area of student uh, learning, we also have some math goals focused on our student proficiency in third, sixth, and eighth. Um, eighth being one of those critical years for math um, achievement, and that's looked at um, or taken into consideration more than once on the state report card. We also have um, goal number four, which is focused on ACT, and that's about moving our students um, to remain above the state level as far as the percentage um, who are college and career ready, um, and then that overall composite. So tonight what I want to walk through first is the student learning, um, just validating and just sharing a little bit more about the strategic actions. So when we look at our first goal, which is really, in, um, and you'll see different people's names, so I'm really here on behalf of the team, so anyone can jump up, but um, in the area of literacy and disciplinary literacy, um, this is what we've been working on in our professional days. Um, coming up this uh, January 21st and 22nd, um, teachers will be, um, learning more about um, just engaging strategies and also just strategies for teaching and planning but then they're going to have some time to actually do that into their lesson planning so it's not just here's some information go figure that out and uh, one and done we really want to come back to the information as part of that um, we're also on track when it comes to january for our special education um, literacy coaching this is a service that we've paid for from CISA 6 and we have someone come in and support the special education teachers um, really on their reading instruction and the reason this is so important is because as a special ed teacher um, you may not have that foundation of just methodology in literacy instruction and so this is a great additional piece uh, for veteran teachers and new teachers um, for uh, the next one you'll see that our areas are goal are, are green and um, this really focuses on that common vision um, that oh, I'm sorry so for strategic action goal three um, this would be Laura and Jennifer Martin but implementing the math curriculum and continuing that with our professional development and instructional coaching support for that um, with our math curriculum with the CPM there's a lot of training that um, goes into supporting a brand new teacher with that if they haven't used that one of the hiccups we've ran into this year is the amount of time that's needed for that and we don't control we don't control those training dates and so if the company says oh we're gonna have this type of training August whatever we don't have control over that so we did have a little hiccup where we ran into an overlap with some of the training as well as some of the training for new teachers because we want them to be in all places so um, we have connected and kind of brainstormed what we could do differently next year the end result though is um, we still want them you know getting all the information but I think we can find a different schedule and maybe um, working with a vendor of the um, resource a little bit differently like maybe we could host it and maybe pick a day um, something like that so that was um, one of the hiccups you know that we had to overcome and through the um, process and planning throughout the year um, Tim's been working on infusing the technology and uh, um, also um, the grading for learning these are several pieces that are really integrated into all of our professional days and whether it's just information um, that is shared or if it's practice or discussion among team members about philosophy and ideas and what they're doing in their classroom compared to another classroom. Um, the strategic action that's listed at the bottom, um, what we were intending to do is to have additional coaching for principals and that um, at the beginning of the year, Laura and I sat down um, with Mr. Kierkegaard and felt um, based on the budget situation, the, su the support we have here within the district office and within the principals that we would discontinue that as a strategic action. In the um, area of engagement and customer satisfaction, I know it's a little dorky, but I'm super excited to share with you that um, while we started the year, um, we had a goal that we wanted to develop our um, an engagement um, survey, 
And while this is just one of the pieces, and I know I'm working probably most on it, so I'm probably most excited, but I'll update you on the other pieces too. But um, at the beginning of the year, it took us a little bit more time than we had planned. Um, and Lance is also my partner on that. And um, what we were doing is working with um, Qualtrics to help us develop a solid um, engagement survey. And we just um, sent that out to staff on Friday. And the number, every time I look at it, the number keeps going up. And so in the survey, what we were able to ask is just questions about overall as the district and then also at the school level. And I've been transparent with the staff and what we'll do is um, we said by March 1st, what we would do is summarize the themes of the results. Um, and then between now and then, if we need additional information in some areas, we can definitely like survey or ask more questions of the staff. Um, but by March 1st, we would summarize the themes. And then what we would do is as we plan for next year, we would take that into um, that information to our planning session so that we're coming up with strategic actions that really are working to increase the engagement of our staff and their satisfaction. Some of the questions are around workload um, to um, do the actions of my leaders, um, do their you know words and actions match? You know, and would they recommend this district as a place to work for other people? You know, that sort of thing. So we had like less than 30 questions, um, but the survey is out and open for people to take for two weeks. Other areas of our strategic action for this, a, mid, a big part is our compensation. Dave Hallman has been working on that. He's had several um, meetings with the team working through that. Um, and has also sent out some updates. Um, in the area of open enrollment, we've um, reviewed some of the data. Um, we need to um, talk about kind of a long-term plan. Bless you. Overall, um, we just we have that yellow because we just need a little bit more time to figure out next steps, especially with the um, with the random coming referendum coming. And what we have done is looked at the information, and um, we'll have some more meetings set up for that. Um, the next area is safe and secure. And again, um, if other people want to jump up, they're more than happy to join me. Or if you have more questions. Um, Dave Ross has been working on the safety pieces as far as um, security. He had already shared some information with you and I believe that will also be on an agenda for next time. Um, goal number two is really to focus on all staff members will receive uh, three hours of combined training and adverse childhood experiences. And our, our staff across the system by the end of January will all have learned a little bit more about human trafficking, the warning signs, and um, just ways that they can just become more informed about that because um, that is prevalent in our area. Um, Tim is working on, okay, we have this joke about SFTP stuff and connections, so I'm like, Tim, data privacy, cybersecurity. <laughs> Tell you. All right, so uh, good evening, everybody. So uh, goal three is really a very broad goal, um, and it really encompasses two pieces, one being data privacy in terms of making sure that our student and our staff data is safe. That being our student information system, um, our online systems, our staff pieces like our, our finance and payroll, and the second really being the security of our network at that point. And so um, at this point, we are about three quarters of the way done mapping a new pro uh, process uh, in terms of how we will look at all of our systems in the district. And so we will basically end up with a, a basically a red, yellow, or green system when we are done. Um, green meaning this is an approved system for our teachers, our departments in the district um, to utilize. Um, so mapping out that process, red meaning no, we don't believe it's uh, acceptable due to our standards here um, in, in terms of what we want. Yellow is that in review or in process piece. And so once we map that piece out, then it's going to be going through the, the hundreds and hundreds of online different pieces that we utilize in, in going through that process for each one. The second part really is around cybersecurity, um, and that uh, hits two different pieces. A lot of that is done behind the scenes by my staff. That is the, um, the pieces of making sure the network is secure, various different firewalls, um, security enhancements, monitoring, and so forth. You'll hear something about that in our internet safety update tonight of some pieces we're doing with our children, um, some enhancement pieces, and the other part will be a training piece that will go along with that, where just like um, every single year we get a little thing from um, you know, an online provider that says I have to do all these different DPI mandated trainings, let it be bloodborne pathogens, let it be medication, um, our staff will go through that process and that training also in the future. So. Thanks, Tim. 
in the area of effective and efficient, um, we had one goal which was around the budget. Um, um, we had information on that. The other goal was around our continuous improvement process that we're using at the school level. This is one goal that um, I did uh, revise with the support and partnership of the um, building principals. So our goal really is to have a common process so that as teachers work on analyzing student data, they're all speaking the same language. And um, what we have done is, again, these guys have been great leaders in this work, um, but in a, for 4K all the way to sixth grade, um, we have a common data process um, that's up and running, and we are using the data into action, and this really is like, if you're cooking cookies and you don't know how to cook them, there's a recipe. You always start with the recipe before you just add your stuff, right? So this really is a book that gives you the process and protocols as the recipe, and from there, you can tweak it, add your brown, more brown sugar, that sort of thing. Um, so that's really exciting. Um, what we did instead of um, having that as a goal for everyone, we needed to just kind of pause because where we're at as a secondary team wasn't the same place as the elementary. And so um, I'll be partnering with the secondary principals um, as far as learning more about the process. Um, and again, um, since these are really our strong strategic leaders, um, they'll also be supporting at times with that um, to get an idea of what that could look like at a different level. Those are the main components of the district part, and so I'll pass it to John to talk a little bit more about the day in the life. Thanks for stealing my cookie analogy, so you know, that was really a, a, I don't know what to say anymore, um, but I probably should learn that. Um, so if you take a look, uh, really, I'm going to focus around student learning and our strategic actions taken. Um, we have a big focus, of course, on math and literacy. Um, you can see the data action model PLC template. That's what our school uses. So a day in the life of a teacher at Green Tree is you analyze your data, you determine what are the learning gaps, what are the instructional gaps, and you develop a plan. And you do that plan with a team. So you may have a specialist, an interventionist, a coach um, guiding you along in the process. The third grade team is lucky enough to have me, so they're very fortunate. But it's a really a team approach to planning out engaging instructions. That was a joke. Yeah. Um, but so, and one of the big things, if you walk around Green Tree, you'll see, and this comes from our district strategic plan, is it all filters down, and our building leadership team and our data review team look at many factors, and one of them is engagement. And really, without engagement, you truly have nothing, and that's really a big focus at Green Tree. So we're consistently looking at, are kids engaged when they're not working directly with the teacher? Are they engaged when they're independently reading? Are they reflecting? So many of those factors really tie into what you get when it comes to a state report card. And so in literacy, we actually have a professional growth class. And so that ties into what Lance does at Silverbrook. Um, but we are focused on writing. And uh, you know, it also varies off into what our literacy instruction is. Um, we analyze student work. So we go through a process where we look at where students score. Uh, what is the typical performance of a student at a certain level? What can we do to differentiate? And then we reflect on the results. Um, we have Jill Corey and Carrie Dresden who run a K-2 uh, portion of our leadership course, or our professional growth course. Uh, Mary Ellen Socha, who's one of our instructional coaches, runs a 3-4 group with myself. And then Lisa Pollan runs a special education group focused on Bridges Math. But it's really important when you talk about the district plan going down to the school plan, it takes leaders at the site. And that's what's really fortunate about what we have, is we have a great staff filled with leaders. Then when you look at math, we looked at this year. OK, so we have a standards focus. We look at our gaps. So we just took the STAR assessment. And what our teams will do is we'll look at it and we'll say, you know, our projected growth is here. Where do we fall short? And what action steps are we going to take? We'll use that same analysis of student work and the data action model and combine those two to plan really effective units. Um, you know, she forgot about the January 22nd was my instructional planning session, which will be really exciting if anybody wants to come to that. Um, but then we look at, like, also, you know, like that increased communication between core teachers and our interventionists. That's so important, is communication but beyond just the classroom teacher. And that's really what we get from our district plan down to our school plan. Um, and now Lance is going to kind of talk about the difference between the past and our current practice. Thanks, John. Nice job. 
Um, so having been in the district for a while, um, we've done various iterations of continuous improvement over the years. And I think with Jen's uh, guidance the last few years, I think we've got more clarity and definitely, definitely more alignment than we've ever had. We kind of have a, a before and a current state of how we do continuous improvement. You know, in the past, we would create a, a site improvement plan in August, or it might be created for us, and it just kind of remains static for the remainder of the year. Many, many goals were on those plans. I mean, many goals, you know, more than really could be accomplished. Uh, oftentimes, stakeholder involvement was minimal. You know, building leadership was kind of entrusted with continuous improvement, but it didn't get to the stakeholder level, it didn't get to the staff level often. And we can go through the rest of those, but really the, the change now, and the biggest change we have is the stakeholder involvement. I had a leadership meeting after school tonight, and our primary focus was updating our SIP. So I've got teacher leaders around the table um, updating their SIPs, adjusting their action steps, um, just being fluid with it and recognizing what's working, what's not, and making those changes real time versus waiting you know, for some predetermined time of the year or, or it never happening. So really good work. And like John and Jen both said, you know, the goals are aligned throughout the system. I'm not creating goals um, just based on my own thoughts or anything else. It, it's all aligned so that the system supports itself, which is really, I think, what continuous improvement is about. And like it says up there, we're reviewing plans, you know, system-wide at least monthly, but teams, you know, when my leadership team meets, they review, when my PBIS team meets, bless you, they, they review those plans, you know, whenever those groups meet, they're reviewing their aspects of the plan, which is pretty cool. Um, and as you've seen, our plan looks similar to everyone else's. You've got the first part, which is the goals. So our goals are aligned to the district goals, but they're unique to Silverbrook. Okay. And then you've got action steps related to those goals. And this is just one aspect. These are the sixth grade uh, reading action steps. But there's fifth grade reading action steps. There's math action steps. So it and it, it's fluid and, and larger because all of those stakeholders have been put into it. So uh, it just is a living living document. Um, I would say, like I said, overall, continuous improvement in the West Bend School District has never been stronger than what it is right now. We've talked about it for a long time. And um, I would say that the clarity around it and the alignment with it is as, as good and really better than it's probably ever been. And that's a credit to all the work of people sitting in back of me and the support from you guys. So, thanks. I didn't bring fireworks or anything. But, uh, you don't feel like you have too many goals. I hope you don't, I hope your sites aren't trying to do 50 things. I mean, when you, when you talk in, in any organization, you don't want to do 50 things somewhat well you want to figure out what your key focus is do you feel that way well what's nice i would say this year is like the data action model and a lot of the things we're doing are a carryover from last year so it almost feels like what we're doing is really like with our data action models refining the process within so the teachers don't feel like it's something new they just feel like we're improving upon it you know we've had a real focus on what our standards tell us to teach and what can we do with those standards? And so the teachers have really, and I've been impressed with the vertical conversation that we've had, but it really feels like a business as usual atmosphere. It's not like, I don't feel this year like we've started anything drastic. It's just been a real strong continuation of last year. I would also add that because of their leadership and other principal's leadership, we're building the capacity of teachers. You know, so this isn't about, one person's way of doing things. You know, this is about teams working together in that professional learning community and building their capacity because Lance and John, they cannot be at every meeting. And so on a professional day, you will see these guys in the building, but they are not leading every conversation. And so building that capacity is just really so important and really helps strengthen our system. I'll give an example. We have our data day next Tuesday. 
And last week at our staff meeting, we talked about our basic data points, and then they developed the plan for the day. And I looked at them and I go, well, there's really not much I can change because they really know where our areas of focus are. They're not a ton, but all the agendas were pretty similar as a data focus and a literacy focus. So it's really nice in that sense. And like you said, it's, it's the leaders in the building and you're not always talking about the site leader, but the teachers that we have at our different grade levels that are very strong. That's great. Any questions from the board? Well, I'm just kind of a comment, and I know Don had brought this up, and we'll look at our disbursements, and we see our teachers on call, and we see that there's a very large substitute teaching need. And a lot of this has to do with the meetings. And I don't know how much of it is professional development, but I know even my son last week in a higher level math class at the high school, two days they had a substitute because the teacher was at a workshop. If there's any way to minimize, you know, that that teacher being out of the classroom that develops their capacity and develops a like that's all good, but it's not necessarily always good for the student. How do you find that balance? I do think that's important overall. Yeah, I think uh, Don talks about that a lot of really, you know, keeping our staff in the building as much as possible. So, for example, a lot of our stuff is um, our professional growth class is from 3:45 to 5. So we do like to keep our A team in front of our students. Great. Thanks for being here late tonight. Nice presentation, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you. All right, Tim Harder, Internet Safety Update. Hey, Tim, our computers are working out. Yeah. I also realized that I probably don't that because I need to get on the agenda earlier. So I don't know how you do that, Deb, but if you could. Help me out. Snacks. Appreciate it. Snacks help. Snacks help. All right. I give you snacks tonight. So I'm going to keep it short. This is the fastest um, presentation I've ever had. It has three slides. Um, so I am promising that I shorten it down. Um, this really is a follow up to the meeting we had in October. And so we had talked about some internet safety pieces that we do with our children um, here in the district and some different resources. And we want to take the opportunity to update the board um, and the public on a couple of different things. Um, and they're really geared around two different pieces. The first being our parent resources and education piece. So we continue to work at adding to the, the pieces that are on our district website on each of our school sites. Um, under our parents and community tab, there is a technology resources tab. And that is information for parents where they can go on and learn about how we not only keep our kids safe here at school, um, on the school district devices or when they're using our internet here, but it really is around what they can do on personal devices to keep their kids safe at home. Um, you know, I, my fifth grader would love me to stand up here and tell him that he is really excited because we talk about when he gets a phone, it's going to be filtered at home and all the downfalls of dad being the tech director here. Um, and, and talking about that safe piece at home. And so we have some great resources out there. There's one um, called Common Sense Media, which is a, an internationally known um, company that provides a lot of our, our resources and the lessons that we use here in our own curriculum also. Um, so in October, we had sent information home to our parents. We'll again be doing this in January. Um, and, and we do that through Nancy Kunkler. Um, we'll do that at the end of January through her Wednesday email and start to promote some of those pieces out there. The other piece is for our parents, and once we have the final date, it'll be April 10th or 11th, we will be hosting a parent community technology night. Um, and we had done one of these a couple of years ago. Um, this will be held up at the Silver Lining Arts Center, um, time to be determined in the evening. Um, and we're finishing up a couple of final presenters at this point, but really the focus is gonna be on the cyberbullying piece, which is a big piece for um, our parents to learn about and understand what apps and kids are using. Um, and then some of the apps and, and control pieces that are out there for our parents. Um, so once we have that, I'll work with Nancy and share that information out. But we look forward to providing that resource for our parents again. Um, we did it a couple of years ago, the last time we had a, a former DE agent who came in and spoke um, and does those pieces. Um, and looking at some different pieces potentially with the, the Cyberbullying Research Center and some other um, local law enforcement potentially to do that. The other piece is really keeping our kids safe at school. Um, and so one of the pieces we talk about is constantly enhancing that, and it's always a cat and mouse game because every time we do something, the kids are going to react. Um, and so um, it's a constant piece that we do, and the biggest part of this is teaching our kids what's acceptable. Um, and we do that from the day they walk in the door here in the district, they see a presentation um, for our one-to-one -one students. Um, all of our students will see that next year um, as we bring one-to-one -to, -one to the ninth grade level next year to both our fifth and sixth grade students' uh, grade levels next year. Um, we build that out from the beginning of what we believe is the expectation for our devices here and what you should use them for. 
Um, but then also throughout the year we'll do different lessons. So this month we are working with Badger Middle School um, with, our, with our coaches and the staff over there around really doing some internet safety lessons for that. Um, we will work with Silverbrook later in the year, the high school, um, and various different pieces, uh, pieces that we will do with that. We also have our counseling staff, um, so our school counselors build that into some of their counselor connection lessons and so forth, especially at the elementary level. Um, we see those conversations being um, brought up about the safety for those different pieces. Um, we're in the process of developing some new digital citizenship backgrounds, so when our kids log into their Chromebooks here in the district, they get a background. Um, um, it's not some pretty you know, sunrise scenery or the West Bend School District logo. It is basically the word think, and it talks about what they're posting online and to think before they post. Um, and those are things that we want to develop some new ones with, so the team is working on that. Um, we continue to review um, our expectations for both personal and school issue devices with our site admins as we roll one to one. Um, those processes change every year. And reminding our kids um, in terms of what is acceptable and what is not. And then last but not least, um, the most current feature that we started to roll out is a, is a new feature. Um, it's some new enhanced security features um, that allows us better logging and, and opportunities to find out which kids are trying to circumvent our security features here. And it's not necessarily our cybersecurity things when we talk about an attack. We're talking about kids who are trying to get around the filter so they can use our network to do whatever they want. Um, and our network is really built for the idea that it is for education first. Um, as much as we have the bandwidth to allow a lot of other things, you know, sitting on Snapchat all day long is not exactly what our network is here for. And so we're rolling out some new enhancement features. With that, what we're doing is, is during the day we're piloting at Badger, we're taking away what's considered open Wi-Fi. You can walk into this building here right now and you can connect to my Wi-Fi. Granted, yes, we can find out who you are. Um, but we are putting in place features where you have to log in with your school credentials. And so that way I know, um, you know, if Nancy logs into the network here and tries to get along, get around the network with her personal phone, She's going to get an email. She's going to remind her from her site administrator, and if she doesn't want to follow our expectations here, we'll just remove her device from the network, and it will never get back on you. Um, and so it's one of those things that those are our expectations that we have. So it takes time to configure each of our sites to do that. Um, Badger is done. We're currently working on Silverbrook, and then we'll work on the high school after that point. Um, so it's really those expectation pieces that we put forward to them. So those are kind of the two updates that I have for you this evening. Questions that I can answer for you later on Monday evening. Thanks a lot, Tim. I think just getting the word out to parents about all these special features that you're adding is important. Mm -hmm. And we will continue to, to share that out there. And so, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. We're on the home stretch. Committee report on the policy meeting earlier tonight. All right. So the policy committee met uh, earlier today at 5 p.m. Three items on the agenda. First was new board policy 224, board superintendent relations. And uh, the policy committee approved that policy to be brought in front of the board next time. So see that on a future board agenda. Then uh, two items revised, board policy 432, school attendance area, and new board policy 336, non-district research involving district schools or programs. Uh, administration is gonna do additional work. The committee will reconsider it at the committee's next meeting. That's all I have. Great, thank you. Superintendent Trick. I will try to keep my comments to under 45 minutes. <laughs> so we'll see what happens. But just a couple quick ones. One is uh, earlier tonight the board approved the, uh, the referendum going to the ballot. And so with that, I will, we are scheduling a tons of meetings around the community. And any civic organization that would like to hear the information, it will strictly be informational. We will not tell anybody ever how to vote, we'll just provide them with the information. Uh, Nancy will be sending out information to you, if at all possible, I like a board member or two, as often as I could to attend the meetings with me so it's not just Don or it's just not another administrator, we're all saying the same thing. And in all cases, it's strictly informational, not trying to be persuasive. I do have a meeting scheduled with all of the teachers on Monday and Tuesday of next week, at which time we'll go over 
the do's and don'ts, to let them know that as a school employee, they can do X, Y, and Z. They cannot do other things. They can't use the computer for to either encourage people to vote for or against the referendum. And as an individual, they can do certain things at home, but they also have to remember that they're always a teacher, always a, an employee, so they truly have to, to be careful. As an administrator, I'm always an administrator. As a board member, you're only a board member when you're an official capacity at representing the board, but you still have to be cautious about how you present yourself in the public on, on yes and no on the, on the referendum, but, but we'll encourage you to, to participate as often, often as you can to help us out when we go to meetings around the area to talk about the referendum. Um, Nancy, we're, we'll meet again tomorrow down at our, our um, architects, or our construction company down in Milwaukee, and uh, they're working on our presentation with Nancy. Um, going to be no more than seven minutes and so that when I go to Kiwanis or when I go to the Optimist Club I'll say that you, you know it's not a 45 minute presentation it's a five to seven minute presentation you can answer questions ask questions on top of that if you would like so we'll try to do that um, uh, Jan talked about the engagement survey so she has been working along with others on the engagement survey uh, um, started it on Friday of last week I think we I don't know if we're up to 300, but we have a lot of participants already, and so we're hoping to get in that 60-70% uh, return rate on our engagement survey. Uh, candidates Forum, I see we have many of our candidates here tonight, and so we have a Candidates Forum scheduled for the 21st and the 30th of January, at which time I will, excuse me. It won't be January 21st, no, I don't because, yeah, because that's because the same day. Yep. So we'll come up with different dates. You're right. Originally, we were looking at the 21st and 30th, unless we can move that up earlier. Um, we'll, we'll come up with a couple days at which time we can help the candidates answer questions they might have. One will be on operations, one will be on curriculum. Uh, yeah, originally we were looking at 21st and 30th. We'll have to rearrange that one on the 21st. And uh, the other the last comment I had was a possible work session, and we have that taken care of. Great. Any questions for Superintendent Kierkegaard? As far as our board calendar, we will likely have a committee of a whole meeting. Um, I, I assume that's what we would call it, committee of a whole, Deb. I don't care what we call it, but yeah. likely have a meeting <laughs> next week on Monday night. Um, and we'll look for your, look, we'll look for a confirmation email on that one. Um, regular board meeting uh, in two weeks on the 28th. Um, with action, uh, I think the kind of the main action item will be a Pathways Charter School decision, 2017-18 uh, financial audit, um, revenues and expenses, and then several reports. Um, we also have a regular board meeting on February 4th and February 25th. Any questions on the calendar? Tiffany, thank you for stepping up, and if for some reason you can't do that next week, let me know, and Deb know, and we'll figure that out. But. Any questions? Any other follow-up items? I would just like to say thank you to Tim Stallmacher for filling in. Yeah, it's obviously people in the room know this, but for anyone watching at home, Tim Stallmacher is, is our uh, kind of interim director of uh, business resources, the business office. And so a former board member, and he's uh, uh, retired in those duties from another district, but he's here to help us out uh, for the remainder of the school year, so I appreciate that. Thank you, Tiffany. I move motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? We're adjourned. Thanks. Thank you.